Welcome, everyone. We'll call the meeting to order at uh, 6.02 this evening. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's a very full house, which is very nice to see. Um, we have a, a full agenda for tonight. And are there um, so done any agenda revisions that anybody proposes? I, I don't. Does anybody have anything they wanted to say on the board work plan, or is that something that we can? I was hoping we could scrap it until okay. next time. It's, it's too much on here. Let's scrap it. Does that feel okay? I'm fine with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll, I'm gonna move that table. That. Uh, any other um, proposed amendments? Did you talk about Alyssa's the conflict of interest? Yep. We um, do we add that already? Board communication. Okay. Wouldn't it fit in there? Um. Uh, shoot. I, I think, you know, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to address that as a separate issue okay. as well, just to um, have a discussion about that. Yeah. Uh, any other any other changes? Any proposed changes? Um, we might want to offer, I know Elliot has come to move up building use for Middlesex Community Access. He has to, he wants to talk to us about it, so I didn't know if, if he needs to leave or something, he might. We, we can move that up ahead. Any, are there any other um, folks who are here for the building for use and building access? Uh, I, I just wanted to, to clarify, there are actually two pieces to that agenda item. One comes from the What's Next Middlesex group, and I think Sally Kevin was going to address that. Other members of her committee are here. Mm -hmm. And the second piece is from the bandstand committee, and I was going to address that. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll do the, those both together, one after the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 No, nope, nope. I okay. think we're going to do the um, uh, conflict of interest um, issue first. Um, so we, we received a, um, um, well, let me back up. Um, any public comments or correspondence with those changes to the agenda? Yeah. Um, um, I received, well, I think we all received a uh, message from Sorsha Anderson about uh, providing feedback in response to um, Alison's request. And I asked, I always asked, do you want it to go in the minutes? And she said yes. So okay. I can send that to. Now, my understanding is it's no longer that if I send, do I send those to you, Christy, or do I send them to? You can send them to me and I'll just send them to Christy. Chris, yeah. okay. You can go either way. Okay. They all get taken care of. Okay. And then you also, Alyssa, would like yours in the minutes as well, correct? You're, you're, you know, okay. Yep. Right. Uh, and we also got a um, an email from Sharon Kersey as well. Did you get that? I did get that. Yep. I have not asked. What I tend to do is to say, "Do you want to do more minutes?" And then people say yes, and then I. But okay. I'm happy to cooperate. However, with other people. Okay. So we also get just got contact from Sharon Kersey. Um, as well, which we'll find out if she wants in the minutes. Okay. Um, so I propose that we um, start with the conflict of interest um, um, issue, and as my understanding is based on the um, survey that uh, Allison Moon, uh, good afternoon, welcome. Um, thank, thanks for coming, Mary. Uh, that um, Allison Cornwall had, had sent out, uh, and uh, Alyssa um, just found a, a um, question as to whether it was conflict of interest. Uh, and our conflict of interest policy um, is at a B3. And um, I invite um, Alyssa if you would like to come and speak to us. Uh, no pressure. If you, if you don't want to, that's fine too. But we welcome to hear from you um, about your concerns so that we can address them and uh, not run afoul of them again. Okay. Hi, I'm Hi. Alyssa, first I'm speaking, I'm nervous. So I, um, I just like clarify like, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so on, I think November 1st, I was asked by Allison to send out a survey to the Romney staff. Um, part of my mornings, just to kind of be abreast of the community you know, going on, um, I will scan through front porch form. Another reason is because we do have an account there, so they always send them to me. Um, going through, on the previous day, uh, October 31st, she had also submitted a front porch form out to the community regarding um, just feedback about, I think it was like the math, um, the literacy. Um, going on and it had included about how um, 
wanting to hear back from, hoping to hear very much from teachers, parents, staff, and community, uh, community members on the issue. So when I received the email from her asking, hey, can you please forward it on under that context, I complied. Like, oh, yeah, you know, just to be helpful and all that. Um, pretty quickly after, I kind of heard, um, I heard a lot about, like, oh, did you see the survey, this about the survey? And it made me like, huh, I've never heard, had so much kind of, like, um, what do I want to call? Not direct feedback, but just kind of like picking it up. So I decided to um, just to kind of like see if there was, you know, if I did something that I wasn't supposed to do, it came to my attention that it wasn't like um, an official, like from the full board. Apparently when you had clicked into the survey, it had said that not everybody agrees with this, but nowhere in her email or in the, and it was a forwarded email, so it was sent to somebody else. Even in the another chunk, it didn't say anything that not everybody agrees with this. Because of that, I decided to look a little further into it, and I came across the policy B3. Um, specifically, a board member will not intentionally give the false impression that he or she has the authority to make decisions or take action on behalf of the board for the school administration. Because she's on the board, and she had said, once you click into the survey, not everybody agrees. And to clarify, I had sent out the email to the Burnley staff without taking the survey because, honestly, as an admin, I don't feel like my opinions really um, has any weight. And I don't, um, I'm not a teacher, Tara. So, um, yeah. Um, and to kind of like back that up, seeing other, um, from Porch Forum Post, I have seen her, specific, um, specifically, okay. um, having clarifying statements like, I, hi, I'm Allison, I'm speaking as an individual or as a parent or a middle set. She typically has clarifying statements like that, so you know that she's not on the board because it was not clear that she was not asking to send this as a parent or a middle sex community member. I had assumed she was speaking for the court and it does not seem that that was so. So I had um, definitely felt put into a position. Um, in my feeling and kind of understanding, it seemed that it kind of kicked up some dirt and that definitely was not my intention. And because um, it wasn't clear, I wanted to be helpful. I wanted to do the best, and I didn't appreciate the situation. I wanted to bring it to the board as a, hey, you know, this was not, and I don't think that this was okay. So, okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any, does the board have any questions? Any? Allison, do you, have, do you want to respond in any way? I mean, just. No, I am sure. I mean, I think Alyssa did a great description. As it happens, when I get the link, probably because it's my account, I see the description. And I didn't actually, I specifically didn't put that this is from Allison because I had talked to some other board members, but not everybody was in favor. And, and I had told, I had sent it to the board and and said, do you guys have any changes? And I had made some changes based on those requests. But even with that, I still didn't get everybody on the same page exactly. And so I thought saying it's just for me felt not right. But um, but no, I, I totally didn't mean to put you in a position. And I see how I should have been much more clear about what was being sent out. That it definitely wasn't my intention. And like I said, I, I actually could, could see when I had the link, like it would show up that this is not coming from the whole board. So my apologies if I cause trouble. The real question for me is what do we do with the responses that, is there any So I've got a few concerns? things for you yeah. that just concerned about what you just said, Allison. Okay. I wonder about open meeting law for the board. If there was discussion happening over email It was or, one, one way. Yeah, yeah, I, I just, and I would wanna, partner with you for those surveys in event. I've talked to Chris when we talk about it. 
I think there was some information that wasn't accurate on the beginning of it, okay. of the work that we were doing. So, and how the work, how curriculum work is done in Washington Central. So I think that that would be good to talk about, and I know we plan to talk about that. Okay. So, so that'll be a follow-up discussion after we're done here, yeah. just to talk about the survey itself. Okay. Um, and did you and also have a problem then with the communication that the board sent out as a group? Yes, I did. Okay. As your superintendent. Okay. Yep. I'm here to partner with you on that, and I didn't know anything about it. Okay. So I think that's the communication that we had agreed upon to try to describe this meeting previously. And that we all did agree upon and send out together. So it sounds like there's a problem with that communication potentially. And then I just used much of that to put into the survey as a descriptor. Um, so that it sounds like both of those things, perhaps. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. OK. OK, so just to wrap up this conflict um, of interest issue, uh, um, you know, the, the policy is what the policy is. Um, you know, I don't think we go beyond uh, where we are now. Um, and it just sounds like we just be a little bit more careful in our communication yeah. so we don't put a staff member in a uh, uncomfortable position um, and just leave it at that, I guess. You know, I don't, I don't think there's any other thing to do at this point. Um, we, we, have we responded to your concerns, Alyssa? Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to apologize on behalf of the board for putting you in that position. Uh, I think this speaks to a larger issue that the board needs to address on the way in which we communicate mm -hmm. with staff uh, and uh, our role in essentially usurping other um, or undermining the leaders within the building. And uh, you know, I was not in favor of the way in which this was handled. In fact, I actually didn't even realize that it was done um, because I think if, if we're going to send out any type of communication, it, you know, first need to be a board action that we discuss and approve on and I realized that this then went out not necessarily as board but with at least you have the given intent uh, or impression that it could be communication from the board um, but it just this is one of I think a larger issue that we as a board need to need to address with the way in which we uh, really engage beyond our role uh, as a board uh, beyond sort of the, uh, the governance of the policy and, uh, and oversight and much more in the weeds of operations. Um, so if it's not now, I think it's an issue that we need to address at a future meeting. Um, we can bring that up, we can take that up at the end of today, and I think we should take it up at the end of today, uh, this meeting, um, just because I think there are varying views on that in that uh, you know, individual board, board members can find out what's going on in the community and so solicit information. Um, it should be certainly above board, um, um, as I think this was, because the survey was out there as a public document. Uh, and, you know, um, I think we, we shouldn't be stymied in sources of information that come to us. Um, and we're certainly not usurping or, un I don't think, usurping or trying to undermine anyone. Um, and, it, and it, I think you're referring to the administration. So. Um, we should have a discussion about that at the end today, uh, is, tonight. I just okay. have a question. Sure. Under um, board communication, yeah. is that part of it? Because at one point, Woden was going to call um, and do some research on how other school boards in Vermont handle it, and I'm, I've been kind of anxious to see so that it could guide us in what we do. It feels to me like um, that part wasn't done, and then we're sort of just pushing it aside and everybody's doing it their way, is it still coming? Like, well, are so we still planning to agree? What I was agree? interested in was doing, um, looking at staff board communication, yes. how we can increase that. What, I've, um, what I proposed is this uh, proposal for increased um, data, um, which I, I sent around to all the board members. I don't know, do you get this from the school board? No. You don't, okay, well that will, um, I'm sorry about that. Um, so that, um, I'm happy to, I think it might be quite appropriate for us to talk about that under the rubric of, of, of data gathering. My interest is really data gathering, um, but I'm happy to, um, to follow up on how other boards communicate. I, I'd like some direction exactly on what you're, what you're looking I, for. That's what I do. thought you were, maybe I misunderstood and it was data all along. I'm, I'm, um, I, it's an evolving thing. Let's, let's talk about what okay. we want to do. Yeah. So just to catch up with Bill um, mm -hmm. and comments on the survey itself in terms of 
uh, inaccuracies in it. So, um, can you tell us yeah, so where, first, where you think it was in it? Because um, can I say want, something to start? We want to have to correct information right. going out. So, so first of all, I want to say to the board, you know, it was with the carousel, and I know I wasn't there last meeting, so um, I should catch up on those things, and I didn't. But first, I want to say thank you for asking for community. I see Beth Holtzman's here, and Beth, maybe you can help Chris and I remember, because we were the only two in the room that were there when we were trying to do this work three years ago, and having community come out and give input into what we wanted our students to know and be able to do. Mm -hmm. So this is incredible. So I want to actually say thank you. This is great. This is exactly what we want. It's community input into what we want our kids to know and be able to do. I think that... Um, the, there are pieces within there, and I want to bring up the survey itself, and maybe if um, in the announcement, I think one of the things that the survey tries to say is that we're using work from a retreat that happened this summer with boards as our school as our work plan. So there's a couple of things that I want to. Uh, put on the table that are contextual. So I feel like, Chris, I need to step back. This is going to be like 10 minutes of, uh, of pieces. Could we step further back what the survey was for? Um, Allison? Sure. So, um, so I sent out the survey. I put it on Front Porch Forum, Facebook, and wanted to circulate it within the Rumney community as well. And the idea was to try to get people to help us see what their goals are for our children because I think we're in the process of trying to define goals for our students. And also, since we're talking about how to get there, I think it's really important that we also talk about what, how people would get there. So at our retreat, like Nate Levinson presented some really exciting and wonderful ideas for, for some things that he would do to, like he defined a goal and how he was going to try to meet that. And so. The survey was eliciting opinions on these things, and I, I, I think that our community includes our staff, mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to make sure to get their opinions, especially since, I mean, of anybody's opinion, like our teachers are super important to know what their feelings are on these things. So, so that was it. So I asked for those things, and I um, actually mostly got responses from staff. Only a few parents responded, um, and I don't, I didn't want to be in the weeds with like a you know, how would you get there? But I don't think that we as a board can make any sort of decisions on what our goals are unless we have a feeling for what that, like, what kinds of things would these be? I mean, are people talking about, we actually would need a whole separate building with four new staff members, or are we talking about something that several people brought up? We actually think that adding in um, extra physical exercise has been shown, you know, data shows this. And, and so those are very different. One costs a lot of money and one doesn't. And so how can we possibly decide? And, and you know, East Montpelier had to decide, for instance, what do they want to do with their language program? Well, if we need to make changes to our language program, I think our community would definitely want to know about that. So if something that people are continually bringing to us is a way to get from, we have to define point B, and then our way to get from point A to point B, if it, for instance, meant that we now did not have language at Romney, I think some people would, would definitely want to know about that. So I just want to make sure that our community has a chance to hear some of these things. They can add their opinions. We're all on the same page. Nobody's surprised. And it, I promise it came from only a place of knowledge and good intention. So I want you to know from Allison, for me, that's, that's the way I see it. But I see that if we partner together, we could have cleared up some of the pieces in the introduction that would help everybody give more contextual pieces of where we're trying to go. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry I don't have enough of these. You've all seen this, but I think it's really important that we go back here. I'm going to go back all the way to 2012 when I was hired. One of the things that was hired, and I still take this and I get this direction from the executive committee, was that we want a clearly defined curriculum process. I, I have a few more here, but I'm sorry I don't have more. I brought some for my car thinking there would be more here. I just keep them around. Uh, and we have, this is a different one. I've got plenty more if anyone wants them. I know all the staff have them because we give them to you guys all the time. So in 2012 when I started as superintendent, one of the things that was asked of me, and I take this as one of the initial community pieces, was that the curriculum system in Washington Central needed to be improved. It wasn't, it was a recognition that the documented curriculum and the actuated curriculum, and I'm sorry to get educational, so if I use a word that does too much educational ease, 
And maybe, Diana, you can help be my traffic cop on this, because you know them, but may say, hey, that doesn't sound there, I would, or any other staff member, stop me. <clears throat> but the curriculum that's worked, that's happening in the classroom, and then what's on documents is very different. And what was documented, what there wasn't a lot of, uh, literacy was the main area, wasn't there. It wasn't there. So develop a pro process. And the other thing that was expressed to me is do create a process that is collaborative in developing it. And one of the things that I hope it was one of the reasons, and I know two of the folks that were on my hiring committee are here in the room tonight, was my belief that curriculum, the experts in curriculum, are the teachers. It's not the administrators, it's not the curriculum def director, it's definitely not the superintendent. So you have to use their expertise in building curriculum. So we built a process right away that brought together a curriculum committee that oversees, that's made up entirely of teachers except for Jen Miller and a principal representative in a, from the elementary school and an assistant principal from U32, it could be a principal. But it is made up of representation from all over the district. They oversee the curriculum processes for Washington Central. Um, and look at that. There were curriculum committees that were built by content areas, and then that has been expanded into the transferable skills as well, and it has morphed into the student learning outcomes. Um, those committees meet primarily now because we try to do it during the school year, but we had feedback from the parents, please don't take our teachers out of the classroom. The theory bearing in it's right, we know it from, um, I'll keep the research aside, but I would well, love to have this discussion. You and I have talked about this. Um, but the, the, the grounded research is the teacher is the most important factor in a student's learning. Highly qualified teacher is the most important. That is like, you, you can go to any meta-analysis of education, it's there. That's the number one factor. Um, the, so we bring those teachers together, so we have moved that to what we call curriculum camp that happens at the end of the school year, where all teachers are invited. Those who want to come, we pay them to come to work on curriculum. And you may say, what's your, I want to make sure I'm clear when I use the word curriculum, that it's not, curriculum in the Latin sense means the path to learning. I don't have exactly right, but that's kind of what I keep in my memory, is it, but curriculum in education can either mean that, so just what's the path, but when we talk about curriculum in Washington Central, we talk about curriculum, assessment, and instruction are all the curriculum. So we have teachers look at building, we looked at work that had been done by, um, by Wiggins and McTide in their work in called Schooling by Design. It's our framework for building it. There are 10 key components in building a curriculum, assessment, instruction, and curriculum. Um, we have templates that these are built by curriculum committees. I'm going pretty fast forward. If someone thinks I skipped something that's a teacher in the room, please just tell me. Um, those folks come together and look at that. Around 2014, in comes the legislation requiring us to shift to proficiencies. So we changed our language. Uh, Beth, I'm just going to say you were helpful in saying, hey, some of this language is working. Remember back to the non-negotiable discussion? And so we call them their performance indicators now. So we have performance indicators of where students should be. We're trying to build a system that that's all built by teachers, informed by research. So we look at national standards, we look at international standards, and teachers look at that research. And in some of our content areas, that has, in some of our <coughs> slows, that's actually been audited by outside experts to say, have you deviated too far from the common core in math or the common core in literacy, um, which is adopted by the state of Vermont as some of the foundational pieces that we get measured against. Um, so those committees, they design the performance indicators, which then roll up into standards, which roll up into the student learning outcomes. One of the things that was a concern starting about 2014 is what does the community want the students to know and be able to do? We asked that question for two years at board meetings. And boards, and the Romney board as well, asked for community to help respond to that. Different communities responded at different levels and different, you know, different levels of feedback. Um, from the, the number of community members and staff that gave pieces into that. In May 2016, what was found is that we had different student learning outcomes across the buildings, and it was agreed upon at the SU 
that we should have one common set of mission for Washington Central and student learning outcomes. So on May 2016, all the boards in Washington Central individually agreed to adopt the same student learning outcomes. If you open up, I need to have yours, Brian, first, but if you'll see them on the posters that are out in the hall, you'll see them in teachers' classrooms. If you open to the page four that's in here, you'll see the set of student learning outcomes on the side here. You'll see them in the big blue posters. You'll see them on a curriculum website. If I had more time, Chris, and I, I suggest that we have Jen come and give a lot more detail to the board about this to understand, because what I just did probably compacted what could be a, long, a longer presentation to understand how do the teachers have input, there's also feedback mechanisms through surveys that are collected to bring that back from the staff of what's working. There are teacher reps from each building for those curriculum areas as well as the curriculum council. Um, and the theory being, I'm not gonna say it's working perfectly, is that there's feedback going both ways on that. Um, so that is kind of how we build curriculum. The plan for Washington Central after that student learning outcomes, um, the executive committee of Washington Central tasked the leadership team to come up with a five-year plan to an implement the student learning outcomes. On September of that following year, we presented that to the supervisory union board and in October, I believe, I'd have to go back and check the minutes to be 100% sure, it was adopted by the, student learning, by the supervisory union board that our plan is the implementation plan that I've handed out to you. The work that grounded that is the work that we have. We use John Hattie and Robert Marzano. They're two of the leading experts in education that do what's called meta-analysis. We can go find research on education that can say many different things. So you have to look at what it, where the where are the intersections? And when you look at research, you should ask a couple of things. What is the context in which the research is done? What's the method or methodologies? And what are the limitations of the research? Before you can say, I'm going to use it or not in your local context. Um, and we really have looked at, we have really used a lot of John Hattie and Robert Marzano's work. Um, we use it in the way we operate in the district and our district work. There's been meta-analysis on that. Do you uh, want it just for the benefit of everyone here? Yeah. Can you just briefly say what, what, um, what it is that you're using for their work? Yeah. No, not meta, but what but Hattie and Marzano. So here's Marzano, school districts that work. He has done a, uh, has looked at all the individual researches of effective school districts and how they've impacted student learning. He's gone through and looked at the distribution of scores, and he is one of the leaders that started around 2003, 2004 out of the McCrell Institute in Colorado. Um, McCrell is the Mid-Continental Educational Research Lab. There are 13 of them in the nation. They do most of the primary research in the, in the United States. He has done another, he's done a whole series, he has this whole series, What Works. He has that, he has what works in schools, what works in leadership, what works in teaching, what works in uh, literacy, what works in technology, what works in classroom behavior. And it's gone and looked at all the research and said, okay, what does it say if we try to pull it all together? And what are the core underlying pinnings? So for, um, I, I don't get too much on a tangent. Is that enough? Do you think I did enough does there? Does that give you a sense of? Yeah, so we're looking at someone that pulls together all this because there's so much research going on in education. You have to look at someone who does that. John Hattie does the same thing. Well, and I've talked about Hattie because he's very popular right now. He started in 2010 replicating some of what Marzano did, but on an international scale. He's actually looked at 100 and, uh, hold on, I'm going to put up the, I put up the web page so I had this in front. He's looked at 252 influences on, that relate to student achievement and have effect on it. The number one effect is the collective efficacies that teachers feel for moving students and improving student learning. So if there's a high level of feeling we can help students learn, there'll be a high effect size for student outcomes. Um, there are other things there as well, and the, we have used a lot of this work in putting together the plan, the implementation plan, and that's guided a lot of those pieces. 
Nate Levinson came and talked to us about one small piece, which is called, in Vermont, as Vermont usually does, it changed the name from what it is nationally. So I want to make sure I use both. In Vermont, it's called MTSS, or Multi-Tiered Systems of Supports. But in the nation, it's called Response to Intervention and Instruction. On Hattie's research, it's the fifth most effective system for improving student outcomes. We don't necessarily look at it in rank order because Hattie has had some counter research to his work and his mathematical standards. So some said, hey, if you look at it as, and I don't know if you've seen this, Katie, from Carleton University, but you can go look it up. I actually had to write a paper about this, that his statistical methods, there's some questions about it. Um, but at least the relative, like, you know, if it's in the top 20 versus the middle third or the lower third, you probably want to look at it. And that's kind of the way I look at it, is I don't say, hey, is one two and one four, and we're going to go with the two, the second rank versus the fourth rank? Because the context matters. It's back to that research. The context matters and how you do this work. So we had fast forward to where we are with the Nate Levinson, and for many of you on this board, and this is where I feel as a superintendent, I haven't done the justice to come back to us, and so I'm really thankful for this discussion, because we've been talking about other things where I think this is probably one of the most important discussions we could have about how, what do we want for our children and how do we help our children get there. So it's what Nate Levinson was talking to us about was a response to intervention or MTSS system. And so that's one, if we looked at the plan and if we look through this plan, and I'm glad to get you more, you will see parts that look like this, that look like an implementation plan checklist or timeline. And you will see MTS on both the instructional system and on the assessment system. There are three big parts of our implementation plan, and those are right in line with uh, Hattie and Marzano's work. One's clear learning targets. Do the kids know what they're going to learn? It, you know, I see that every day. We worked really hard on that our first year of this implementation plan. The second year is a clear, the second piece is a clear and balanced assessment system. All our local assessments, whether it be uh, Faunus and Pinal or STAR 360s, those have been selected by our content committees, our curriculum committees, as to what we want for assessments. We actually piloted different math assessments and found they weren't the ones we wanted, they weren't giving us enough information, so we moved to STAR 360. That came out of the Math Steering Committee. The, uh, Fonts and Pinnell, DRA2, and STAR360 reading, those have come from those committees. Um, and then the third place is a high, uh, I've got to read it to get it right, I'm sorry, but it's just lost it, a high quality instruction and intervention system. One of the other things that Hattie is saying and is in his top 10 is that there, uh, is that there are intervention systems that help students so when they don't learn or they're, having, they're struggling to learn, how do we help and give them more support in doing that? So I think that those are all important contextual pieces for how the curriculum system and our system works, and it's constantly under revision. It's not like there's a set that we try to keep the standards and the student learning outcomes the same, but the performance indicators will change because we'll learn and adapt and grow, and that's happened over years in education. You know, what we expect of a graduate in high school right now is much, if I go back to 1985 when I graduated at high school, the literacy expectation was about a sixth grade reading level today. The math level was not even algebra one today. So our rigor is increasing over the years and that's, that's natural. We see that in the national science standards. They're bringing in engineering concepts that weren't even there before. Um, so those are pieces of how we do that work. So I think that those are, so when I thought back to the survey, I think it's really, it's excellent to ask folks, what do we want to know, have our kids to know and how, and know and be able to do? And how do we want to teach that? Because that's important to ask that question and to use research to support how we do that. Um, but to me, ultimately, that's information to give to the teachers and they're working across the SU because we all flow it, we all, we're all one system. Doesn't mean the instruction and how we do the instruction 
if we pick away uh, the one the thing I go back to my science teaching days if I want to teach something about ecology and for some reason I want to use the river and sorry Dan I'm looking at you and you want to go use the forest out back and we're going for the same PIs there's nothing wrong with that that's local context but we need to understand that the kids understand the, the water uh, water cycle or no um, resource allocation you know we can get to that and that that's really important and that frankly I think not just for the building we do that we should be doing that for kids and groups of kids and what helps engage them in the work what are they excited about and how do we use that to get to the same PIs um, so I think then when we think about that so I just wanted to kind of set all that because it was too focused on Nate Levinson and not the work that we're doing as a whole and what is the impact where are the inputs throughout the system for designing a curriculum in our instructional systems? So um, how would you improve the survey in terms of accuracy? Um, I would want to say something about, um, I would want to make sure we have those contexts before we say I wouldn't want to have things in there about Nate Levinson, not because Nate's done anything bad or good. I think it's just too fine a pinpoint on everything that we're trying to do with our instructional system. And I think that we'd want to be able to look at, I think we want to be able to look at the data a little bit more. I think taking the survey without having the contextual to respond to it, you know, it's like you all had the response, you had the context of the SU presentation and Amy's presentation. And I saw that that was, was added to the survey to some of the emails that went out but I don't think that that captured what Amy said I think it just gave the slides and I know it's hard to do that but I think it's important to have those types of conversations and say and go back to that what do we value that we want in the big picture I actually would say leave the research to the education experts Say what you value. What do you, how do you value your kids learn? How do you value for what they will learn? You know, and, and get that on the table. And ask and say, come back to us and show us that you've built an instructional system that does that. I'd be less worried about the research. Leave that to the education experts, your staff. And I'm saying, I'm not putting me in with that. I'm saying the teachers that, that you've got committees that are working on it, they're highly competent. I have a question. Um, at our meeting in August, we asked about if somebody creates a document and it's emailed and people edit and send it back to that person, that that was not a violation of open meeting laws. Is that correct? In my interpretation, it is. But you may find other interpretations out there that may disagree with me. In my interpretation, I would say that that's fine. I think Vermont League of Cities and Towns is in agreement with you. Yes, I've seen other places that aren't. That's why I'm saying that word. Okay. I thought at the August meeting you had said that was allowed. Yep. Yeah. So it is... It, From my interpretation, I'm telling you I've seen others that have said no. Oh, you're saying it is allowed, it is allowed. not a violation. In my oh, okay. interpretation, I'm going to tell you that I've seen others that say, would say it is. Okay. And is it different if... Um, instead of giving like edits to that document it was more like do you agree with sending it out does that change your opinion on if it's a violation of open meeting laws I, I think what the spirit of the, the and it was mainly the senate that was ruling on this because this was a couple years ago and they tried to do it again this past year was to allow more electronic resources for public boards to do work I think the spirit of it was not to allow people to have access for conversation or back and forth. Okay. And so I'm not going to say yes or no to an individual instant. I'm going to say the spirit of doing work outside of a place where the public could watch you do your work. Public okay. boards are required to do their, their work and open. That so if you... That's why I said what I responded earlier. I mean, it may or may not be. I don't know because I haven't seen the work. 
you know, and it, it, it's that spirit of the public can engage and what not do the work with you, but watch you do the work is what I've read in the Senate work and have been trained in from public response. Different boards do that different ways, and that's okay. But it, it, the bottom line is that the public can observe you do your work. You could do it more open if you want. There's nothing stopping you from that. But the bottom line is that they can observe you do your work. And that, that to me is kind of the premise of open meeting law. I just want to say, Bill, I really appreciate what you just said in terms of providing context and and, um, and encouraging us to blow it open, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of thinking about what, you know, going back to those fundamental goals, because I think that that's right. absolutely where we and need to go. And I'm thrilled, actually, that everybody's here. We had, um, at the last meeting, we had really identified this is a meeting where we wanted to hear from people right. about what your goals are. Um, well, can so I, I'm, I, I'm I forgot to once. take a chance to, to do that now, Chris. I'm but, sorry. Yeah. There's one other thing I forgot to say, yeah. and I don't say that. I hate quoting statute because people think I'm trying to be harsh and I just want to inform, okay? In 2011, with the Passive Act 153, it required that curriculum be developed at the school district supervisory union level. I don't think that inhibits the conversation, but it's a piece in the conversation. And I think it's important just to recognize that and to know that. And that was a lot of the work that was done from 2012 to 2016 to get to that common place. It was like, how do we lay all this foundational work to get so that we can have the curriculum committees, because this was a concern that was expressed to us by teachers. Can this be torn apart? Because if we're going to go do all this work, we want to know that it's pretty stable. I hear that still. I heard that today. I was with 12 teachers today all day. And do this torn by part by who? Um, by anybody. I mean, they're not asking a gen They're not asking a who, Chris. They want to know how. If I'm going to put a lot of effort into creating something, mm -hmm. will it stay for a while? Because the last thing teachers want to do is go do something that's either looks perfunctory or is I'm going to put a lot of effort and then someone's going to tear it apart. So they'll say, I was working with a group of teachers that were working on coaching today for across the SU, and I asked them for some pieces, and I said, guys, from my point of view, for all I can do as a superintendent, I'm giving you the authority, the responsibility, and the accountability to do it. Go figure it out. Make sure it's aligned with good best practices. We were talking about coaching, and we were with an expert today doing that. And say, what does that look like? And please give me back a document of what you think as teachers job coaching should look like. Tell me what that looks like, you know? And that, that they want to know that they're, they weren't, and they said, so Bill, if we do this, who has the ability to, to, to change this and morph this? And I think it's a really fair question. If I'm going to go do a lot of hard work, you know, who's going to stand behind? And, and, and so that's all I, I just give that for, that's a concern that's always in education. I think every educator has that, has that concern. And rightly so, because our history in education is that that isn't the case, that things do get, get changed. Mm -hmm. And we are going to evolve. That's, that's part of the nature of our business. Okay. Um, so in terms of talking about surveys and having information for people to, to understand some of us can understand things at a more complex level, not everyone can. So in order for the community, as well as teachers, as well as administrators, to have a true understanding, I think that you may want to have a very concrete structure that you can express to all, because I watched some of the um, Nate Levinson conference that you all had in mm -hmm. August, didn't watch all of it, <clears throat> and I've read some of the um, literature that came, and I have to say that what I did watch from the conference left me feeling very concerned because the, the mood and the way that things were being talked about and presented felt very much like this is how we're going to go forward. And I'm paraphrasing, but 
there was talk about how well teachers will resist this because people get comfortable and you know you just push through and they're going to talk about a whole child and of course we want that but and so I think it for people who have heard those things seen those things there's a sense perhaps that things have already been decided so I think that people going into planning and changing curriculum changing the way that um, teaching happens changing the way that additional instruction happens changing um, the way that support staff are implemented in schools I think there needs to be a real clear understanding that it really is a collaborative process and that it really is about listening to the teachers obviously because they are the first line in teaching children but there is also the community in terms of um, the parents whose children are coming to this school and the others in the union and it, it just I think I think everyone needs to be coming from a very open and honest place and I think if there are certain things that you feel you are going to implement regardless that needs to be clear and um, be because everybody needs to be able to do the work and know what the parameters are mm -hmm. and I don't feel that that's always clear and I think sometimes when you sit in conferences and you're hearing different things and you can think, oh, this is great, this is great, let's move forward with that. And the supervisory union as a whole is an entity, but each school within that union is its own living, breathing entity with its own personality, with its own sets of challenges. And you, I, I personally feel that you, you just can't use a one size fits all. Um, certainly improvements can be made and do I want children to be literate and numerate? Absolutely. But I don't want that at the cost to them in terms of social and emotional development. And all there's a lot of talk around that too and how important that is or isn't. I think it's hugely important from what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And children will better access centres of learning within themselves barring um, learning difficulties they will access those better if the social and emotional aspects of who they are are taken care of. So, again, I just feel that there needs to really be absolute transparency and honesty about the processes and if there is already a sense that X, Y or Z is going to happen regardless of what anyone else thinks. Because some things feel very much like they've been decided and maybe that's not the case. So that there's just so much unknown and there's so much and it just feels like we're in a swamp so much of the time and it's been this way for a long time. So and and, and I I sometimes feel out of place talking because I'm not a middle sex resident, but I do work here and I am so connected to this community here mm -hmm. and I feel really emotional because I work with these children every day and I know them and I see them and I know that the teachers are so dedicated and I want the best for them so I don't feel like someone coming from the outside they can have great ideas for us in terms of improvement as perhaps a solution but not necessarily the solution mm -hmm. so I just feel that we all have a stake in it I don't live here, but I feel that I'm as invested as anybody who does. So if we could sort of move forward being really, really honest and really, really clear so that when people answer these surveys, when they talk about what they really want, they're not pouring their hearts and souls into this only for something to have already been decided and this is really just sort of window dressing to make you feel like you have a stake in it. I think we're in the same place because I would say to you, Julie, that that's why I don't want the, the Nate Levinson piece on this is the wrong label. The leadership team in Washington Central hasn't even unpacked his work. So we're still trying to talk about how does what we've learned from him impact the implementation plan. 
So that was a learning, that was a common learning time for the board members and how that was designed. So when I was at that retreat, we then went around and multiple people from multiple schools described how they had over the past many months or even small number of years been implementing those strategies. So am I not so, understanding something? Yeah, you're looking at the whole, you're using the whole of what he described yeah. for the pieces. People talked about the pieces that weren't similar that are being done in the schools. So he came with a whole package of what the system that he's putting together he has put together in his work and what the, DM, the district management group puts together um, for the work that they've done with multiple, multiple schools around New England and the nation and many, many in Vermont. What, this is back to what I said before. The key is, is not Nate's work. What he was describing was response to intervention or multi-tiered systems of supports. And that's what we've been working on is multi-tiered systems of supports. You could say, hey, is inter tier two interventions, which he was talking about, interventions for struggling learner? Have we been putting those places? You betcha we've been putting those in place. Those are across the, yeah, Joanne's like, yeah, we, years. yeah, <laughs> Ten years right. Ago, we've been doing those things, right? So it's, but to, to say we haven't done everything that he's saying we should do, and we haven't decided if we should do everything he's saying we should do. There, and this is, this is where the educational, this is part of the education community I like your word, Julie, so I'm going to take it, swamp, is, is that there's many different pieces that you see people will come back to with research, but which piece are you using and what is it, how is your context of your community influence what you do? And that's really, really important. I, I, I agree with everything you said. Totally. And, and it's just we need to, we haven't gotten down to that, to that work yet. So I just want to stress the importance of clarity of communication um, because what you just said, Bill, is really um, alleviating a lot of my anxiety over what mm -hmm. I've heard this board is supporting. Um, so Dan, when you say what you be clear on what I it will is be very that, clear. Okay, thank you. So um, I am not on Middlesex Front Porch Forum because I don't live here, but um, earlier this year, I think at the beginning of the year, um, a, a letter that was put on Front Porch Forum was um, passed around to the staff that said um, after this Nate Levinson workshop, um, the feeling from the board was that um, we need to have highly qualified teachers teaching kids, right? So, so that kids are spending most of their times with highly qualified teachers. We don't need paraeducators. We need to increase class sizes. Um, and that that was the direction that we were going, which completely contradicts how Rumney School teaches children. Um, and so nothing has come out since then, right? And there's this misconception, Bill, what you just were saying, that we do follow MTSS. We do believe in a multi-tiered system of support for students. Mm -hmm. There's a saying in my classroom, you know, in this, in this classroom, in this school, you get what you need. Right, that we're here to support um, what students need to get them right. um, to, to succeed. And so uh, there's, there's a miscommunication. Right, and so I have to say this for the board, I wanna say this for the board. Remember how we just talked about open meeting law? Yes. So they can't have discussions yes. unless it's an open meeting, right? right? So I think I wanna say for the board, for them, well, Eastmont, Pitt, Ruben Bennett, and the East Montpelier board said, we want to ask all the board about some of the things from Nate Levinson. So they asked, they sent an email out saying, hey, can you guys discuss these other pieces? The only place the board could do that is here. Right. So I want to give them some, I think some just, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my words, but give them some, some space. They've got to have those discussions and this is where they can have them. And it's hard, it's hard for me as a superintendent, so I can't imagine for, and it's been, 15, 20 years since I've been a teacher in the classroom, but to hear that type of conversation when you know it's going to impact your work. Right. So they, they, they have to have those. And not only have the conversation, but let other people know that it's happening, or yeah. at least, you know, um, put out what the actual conversation is instead of maybe what interpreted conversation was. Right. 
and I'm guessing <laughs> if um, the board minutes were passed around, the teachers necessarily wouldn't read the minutes word for word. You think wow. like a summary to the staff would be appropriate? That would be brilliant. That would be brilliant. We'll go ahead oh. first. Well, I guess um, my question in terms are, are of... Are you actually going to change the subject, though? If you're going to change the subject, can I just respond really quickly? But if it's the I same, then... changing the subject, necessarily. Okay, but you sorry. can respond. Sorry. Um, I know, I think, I know what letter you're talking about, because I'm pretty sure that I wrote it. Okay. And um, <coughs> so I've been trying to, after every meeting, send out a summary, because I think a summary would be brilliant also, and we couldn't agree on how to do that. So I say, I'm... I was, as a person who was watching the video, who would get nothing more than, you know, any person watching the video could have gotten this information. Let me try to describe for you what happened. I'm not going to go through, we spent $12,000 on a boiler or whatever. But, and so, and I thought I was pretty clear in that letter. In fact, I walked through the halls and people wouldn't look at me in the eye because they thought that I was saying that paraeducators should all be fired. I was repeating what you would have gotten from watching an ORCA video, and yet somehow, so I, I'm not sure how, like, I, I read it over and over, and boy, I thought it was clear. We had a retreat. This was what was presented. We're going to be talking about it in the future. And so I'm really sorry that you got that impression. I will read it again, but boy, I've read that thing 20 times because I felt like I had done something terrible when people seemed very angry. And I really didn't, boy, I sure didn't get that from, from any of my summaries. But maybe if we can make a summary together, like, I totally agree that that would be the best thing we could possibly do. It just seems almost impossible to get anybody to agree on what to say sometimes, so, which is frustrating. I so. got it from the video. I didn't even see what you wrote, so I have no idea about that, but I watched the video. Or a lot of the, um, no. the retreat in August? Yes. So sorry, I don't know that's where I got my impressions. Mm -hmm. So everything that Bill described around how curriculum and instruction and assessment are developed sounds very familiar to me in terms of what I've seen so far and what I experience in my own work as a teacher. But what feels to have not been said is that at the last board meeting that I was at, there was this proposal of a guarantee. And that um, what I believe I heard Bill say is that East Montpelier has adopted the guarantee, and I am asking, the other boards, are you in? Do you agree to adopt the guarantee? And so my concern is that the guarantee is not in line with necessarily all of these other components because the guarantee will change the way that instruction happens and it will change the options that exist at our school. And so that I feel like in terms of transparency is the lack of transparency that what we're really talking about is, are, is the board adopting a guarantee and what are the terms of that? And secondly, when I watched the Levinson video, what I observed is that elements of Levinson's work have already been applied, and that seems to have been set forth at least six months ago in the schedule that was proposed and implemented and changed. Um, and so that leads me to believe that there is a path to shifting our system to the guarantee, and I don't feel that that's been expressed, and I actually feel like that um, was completely not expressed in what you described in terms of what's changing or not changing at our school. Because the way that you described the curriculum and assessment and instruction plan is what I would expect at any school that's doing best practice. And that's, that's what I would expect to see. But it does not align with the question of the guarantee, which I think is why everyone is here tonight, is that there's been an awareness that this is on the horizon and it's not being talked about. So. Um, that's why I'm here, is to find out, are you actually going to discuss this question and what are the terms of it? And will you be honest as to what the outcome is that you are actually striving for? Not literacy and numeracy, but how will you measure it? And if that measurement is solely aspect scores, then I think our community will have a lot of questions. So that's, that's why I'm here. I'm not sure if that's why a lot of other people are here. But. I wanted to say that. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah. I'm looking at the nodding yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I have really appreciated the times when you stepped out and put on this other hat and said, I was at the meeting, but I'm not representing the board. I don't know if that's an okay thing for you to do, but as a community member, I have loved Allison's summaries. I think they've been very clear. I thought yours was very clear that you were saying this is what was said. I never thought that you thought that Paris 
that should be replaced in with, you know, get rid of pairs and put coaches on. I understood very clearly, though, that that was said at the meeting. So like Diana, it feels to me like um, I, what my, the reason I'm here is I want to know how far down this road we have gone and how far down this road you intend, you intend to go. If it's a piece of it, great. But if it's, like Julie said, if it's the, if you're looking at it as the Nate Levinson, uh, his best practices are the way to go, he says replace paraeducators, which would in some cases double the class size, the class ratio. He does use um, national data, which I think is ridiculous to compare schools to national data. Staffing data, I went back and checked the report. The staffing recommendations at the end are based on national um, national staffing issues. That's ridiculous. We don't we don't have the option of doing things that people can do in a more heavily populated state. We don't have that option. We have a really wide geographic area and really small schools. And I, I'm, I'm here also because of the concern that if we're using only standardized test scores as a measurement, I have grave concerns about that. Um, I, I've stopped responding, but I'm more than welcome to, but I just think I want to let people what? hear. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so I can here. explain a lot of these pieces, but. <laughs> Please talk. Up to you. I don't no, know. no, you were, you know, we're, um, okay. anyone from Worcester we don't want to hear from? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have to hear all, all voices. Well, you, may, you may change your mind. Not, I don't know. Um, you know what? It's just one of many. <laughs> I, I don't speak for the Lumley Board, obviously, but uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, my, I'm Matthew DeGroat. I'm on the Worcester Board, and I serve as the chair of the, of the WCSU Board currently. Um, and I also served on a small group of like there were three of us who worked with Bill to identify possible topics for our retreat and ultimately to select Nate and ask him to come and, and work with us. Um, the purpose of that retreat really was, I guess there were two. One was to kind of give us a give the all the board members across the SU and all, all the schools. Um, more time during a day to interact with each other than we typically get through in an entire year. Because our meetings are so focused on, you know, sort of transactional business, um, and especially over the last two or three years, you know, so much of our time has been eaten up by talking about Act 46 and debating that and trying to figure out what we're going to do about it. So that was the first thing, was just to kind of, you know, create a space where we could, you know, kind of talk to each other and have something in common to, to talk about. And then the second thing was really to, to invest a significant amount of time uh, just talking about education and educational outcomes. Um, so there were some things that Nate said that I found compelling. There were some things that I had questions about. Um, but I'm not an educator. Uh, I'm not a teacher. I don't, and I'm not responsible for uh, teaching classes or for, over, you know, um, overseeing teachers or developing curriculum or anything like that. The board has an entirely different role. So I would never, you know, I didn't come out of that conference thinking like, Nate Levinson, that's where we're going. And I, don't, I don't really think that any <laughs> board member came out of that or any staff person came out of that conference um, feeling that way. So I'm really glad to be here and hearing that there's this perception of that or worry that, uh, you know, that we're just, you know, adopting the Nate Levinson plan or something. Um, you know, going forward. Um, but what I will say I am interested in is uh, a conversation about um, as boards and as representatives of the communities that have established these schools for the purpose of educating their young people, um, what, are, what do we want to, um, what do we demand of the schools in terms of uh, what happens for kids while they're here? Um, educational outcomes, in other words. Um, you know, Bill's done a great job of describing all the tremendous amount of work that's gone into creating our student learning outcomes and, create, and creating our implementation plan, which I think are great. And as many people have said, there are many good things that are already in place and happening. Um, but one thing the boards never have done is, is sort of say what's acceptable in terms of how many kids are achieving those outcomes. Um, and to what degree. We've never ever said anything like that. Um, and so as a result, every time we get a student a monitoring report about the student learning outcomes, 
the administration, the leadership team, has had to assume that what we mean is that 100% of the kids have to be achieving 100% of the outcomes. And so they have to tell us, every time they give us a report, that they're not meeting those outcomes. Um, so there's, that's the conversation, really, is and that's how the idea of a guarantee came up. You know, do we guarantee that kids have to be literate or be numerate by a certain age, or you know, is it 80% of kids that you know um, we're, we're not thrilled, honestly, with the you know the kind of percentages that we're seeing? And my sense is that it's not just based on SBAC scores, um, but there are, are both um, you know state level and local assessments as well as you know, report cards. Um, looking at those in the aggregate. You know, we're just, we think there's probably space for improvement. Um, and so we're interested in, in, as boards, this is my interest, I should say, my interest, is in, is in the conversation about what are we going to hold ourselves accountable to as boards? What do we want to tell the leadership team and the school system that we're going to hold them accountable to in terms of outcomes? Um, and then how that gets done is really up to the, the people that are doing the work. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if that's helpful at all. I, I think that's wonderful. Can we turn it into a question, especially for those educators who are here? Um, which, what I'm hearing you say, Matthew, is, you know, first of all, how are we doing? Second of all, what's the gap? If we're not doing as well as we want to, what's that gap look like? And third of all, how would we think about getting there and how would we measure it? Is that, is that an accurate? Yeah, more or less. And I, I guess I would just add to that that, um, You know, I feel like our student outcome numbers have been flat for many, many years. Um, and so I would, I'm really interested in whether it's possible to change that, if it's possible to move the needle, um, both overall and then especially, again, um, in the numbers that we see for kids that are, you know, quote unquote, at risk or not at risk. Um, so those are the questions that I'm interested in. I think having guarantees can be fine in some realms, but I, I think that when you talk about education and when you talk about communities of children who have vastly different needs and challenges, to start setting guarantees in place then creates an enormous amount of pressure if those suddenly are not being met. And so do, they, do we then have practices that are just unattainable? Do we then have teachers burning out? Do we have this sense of panic because, oh my goodness, let's look at the results here. We're not meeting that. We're not meeting district goals. We're not meeting national goals. Yes, we want to improve. Certainly, we all want the children to be doing the very best they can do. But sometimes I think we can sort of hobble ourselves by saying, well, let's put a guarantee in place. And we can say, let's do X, Y, and Z to, to meet that. But if we're not, that's another set of problems right there. And then it has to be talked about again. It has to be reworked. So I personally would feel very hesitant to start throwing out guarantees. I think we can guarantee that we will work really hard to, to do far better, and we can set some systems in place to try and achieve better outcomes, but I would personally hate to see, well, we guarantee but that by this time we will have this in place mm -hmm. with this group of children. I just don't see that it's necessarily feasible. Yeah. I? So I'm, oh sorry, I, I'm just remembering back to when we had the conversation about the student guarantee and our principal said at least three times that she was hoping we would stop the conversation until we included staff and that it would be really important to get staff input and I feel like um, we maybe let the conversation go on too long um, instead of stopping when she said that and making a plan for how to get that input. Um, because certainly the intention was not to have anybody feel um, disrupted or unsure or unsafe. It was really about if the board had a focus and a way to look at things, we could then base decisions on, you know, where it fell. And um, 
I don't actually see student guarantee on the most recent agenda. They're not, it's not on the agenda. Okay, so I, I think um, rather than kind of explain and go through like what each of our opinions was on it, maybe we could have um, a plan of how to communicate that piece with staff or get input on that piece with staff that we do as a whole board together that is not in a survey but after a discussion or whatever we decide is the best um, avenue. But um, it seems like there's... I, I, I tend to think it would be worth a, uh, a meeting mm -hmm. just to talk about the guarantee and invite staff mm -hmm. administration so that we're exploring and, and as a board meeting dedicated to that alone um, to get input on you know the different perspectives uh, I, I would say I was intrigued by the idea of a guarantee um, just just because of um, the importance uh, that we've been told for literacy and numeracy at early ages as foundational points for later uh, and you know a guarantee but we debated the word guarantee because if you're going to say guarantee uh, folks think that you are going to do it, um, as opposed to, well, I'll try really hard to get to these these um, goals, um, but you, you know, getting behind a guarantee um, would be a dramatic step because it really is saying this is what we intend uh, for our students to be able to, this, this, to have these skills. And Rick, just we we never got there, but it was that was you know this, the extremes of the debate of saying, you know, some saying that they were, they were thinking about that, or they're saying, nope, it would be, it, because it would overwhelm the other aspects of education. And if you, you're making this guarantee, then you have to reallocate the resources that are not changing <coughs> much, I don't think, um, toward it. So, um, you know, I think that we should have a full discussion um, and at a time when most staff would be able to come. So I'm thinking like right after school. Um, and, and, and just so we can also flesh out what that means. What, the, what does the word guarantee mean and what standards are we looking at to measure it? And so. so a couple things I want to say. Um, one, one of the things that we've had front and center in all our assessment conversations is that you have to triangulate the data. There's three pieces of data that we're really looking for. Um, you can call it different things, but we want, and we want to see that there's calibration between them. And not, there isn't one assessment that can measure everything. If you think there is, that we know that's not true. Okay, okay? it's not true. So if you don't look about multiple assessments with multiple me assessment methodologies, and as I see the teachers that are in this room, I know <coughs> you guys are doing that. You know, I just think of when I walk through the room and I don't even have to talk to the kids, I can walk the walls and walk, look at the walls and see all the different things that are going on. That's why we look at report card, um, our local assessments that have been agreed upon by teachers, and this SBAC scores. Katie's 100% right, you shouldn't just use SBAC scores to drive your work, you should never do that. The problem is, is we have to create a lot of assessments and that takes a lot of time for teachers and then you need to know that they're valid and reliable. The closer you get to the relationship between the teacher and the student, the less valid and reliable it needs to be because they know the context of each other. That's really powerful to say. I can't say that enough. You don't need to go take the technical validity that you do for an SBAC and administer it the way it is. So, and a teacher's making a thousand decisions a day. So that report card data, we're just, this is the first year we've been able to really look at that and say, what's that telling us? And I think that that gives real big power to the board. To the guarantee point, I want to say, I have biases from my own learning experience. Everybody does. And my bias is being told several times in high school and several times in college that I should get at, you shouldn't be allowed to graduate or be here because you don't have the literacy skills. And I'm lucky that I had parents that were willing to fill it in on the backside. And I, can't, I come from probably one of the most privileged aspects. I'm a male, I'm white, middle class. I had all those resources. What I worry about are for kids that don't have the resources. I had a mom who was an educator that went into my high school because everything was tracked and they were gonna put me down in lower tracks. 
And she said, I don't care if he fails. You put him in the higher track, we'll take care of him. You put him in the highest track classes. I worry about the kids that don't have that support. And so when I think about it, we can use guarantee or I know that language isn't popular, but we have to be able to say to kids, in our society, the most foundational skill is literacy skills. And I'm a math science teacher. And it struggled without having those literacy competencies that I still struggle with today, not as much. But if I hadn't had someone that was saying, I'm willing to give you all the interventions, we're going to figure out how to do it. And luckily today in education, we've moved a lot from the 70s and 80s. We're in a lot better place than we were. But I worry about the kids that when we are seeing a three grade level gap right now in our sixth graders entering U32 for students that are at risk in literacy, we're having to not let them have choices at U32 in their classes so we can work on that. That concerns me because I want the well-rounded kid. I want the well-rounded child. But if the gap was smaller and we were able to attack it then, when it was not as big a gap as three grade levels at the beginning of seventh grade, we can give the kid a lot more choices in their education and a lot more experiences. <coughs> so that's why it's important to me. Sure. Um, just to provide a little, a little bit more uh, context to, I think, um, all of this discussion is that we haven't had it too extensively really here on this table, um, but it's been something uh, that's been talked about uh, at the full board and at different boards and um, at a uh, supervisory union um, board committee that I'm involved with, the school quality committee. Uh, and something I'm really, I guess, passionate around is the idea of the achievement gap. And the uh, there's sort of this, there's this understanding uh, sort of across, not here in Middlesex, but across the supervisory union, uh, and Bill was touching upon that, of this pretty significant gap that exists between um, kids who are on free, free and reduced, reduced lunch, um, or on say an IEP, and that those that are not, or ESD. Uh, or ESD. Okay. They're all. We make. Ex uh, let me. Just, I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. Sorry. But just we make a category call student. It's it's the best name to call it now. And I just learned this two weeks ago. Is students that have been historically disadvantaged, and those are kids that are in poverty, that have some sort of plan for learning, or are racially in a minority. Uh, so, so what trajectory are we um, setting up for those kids long term uh, in their life, where um, you know, essentially their their ability to um, to achieve a um, to access advanced education, uh, whether it's a traditional college degree or some type of other advanced education, to better their life to you know, potentially break the, the cycle of poverty they might be living in or uh, something along those lines. Um, but also uh, kids that, as, Bill, as uh, Bill referred to earlier, like himself, that, uh, you know, historically haven't uh, necessarily been um, thought to have had the potential to, to do what they can do, but with the right amount of support. Um, that's possible, and oftentimes, traditionally, that's been because you have um, a strong family supporting you, uh, but not every kid has that. Uh, so that, I think, that's sort of been, a, I'd say, just a thread that has uh, been discussed and I think is in some ways um, informing some of these conversations that I think the different boards are having around what it is that we want to achieve uh, and uh, you know, expect of our students to be able to, to accomplish. Yeah. I absolutely appreciate what you're saying, and you know, my husband has a learning disability and is a manager, and he's he struggles with this every day. And my daughter is in reading group because she's behind in the literacy, so I obviously wonder, is that why? But at the same time, her happiness because she knows she's lower than the other kids in her class come from her specials, come from being in art, and she has noticed. I don't get to do that as much. Her confidence is so much down in the past like few months that I I just I totally understand that. 
but please don't lose sight of the whole child because that's so important for me and for others. I was just trying to get clarification on what you were saying. <coughs> it sounded like you were saying in elementary school, focusing on math and literacy and then get people to a similar level in seventh grade and then at seventh grade you can look at that. whole child. I'm not even saying that. I'm saying that because of the gaps we have currently, Kyle, we are taking away opportunities for kids at middle school at U32. We're, we're, we actually are closing the gap at U32. The good news is we're able to close it. It's taking us three or four years from seventh grade to tenth grade to close the gap. We're doing it. Uh, but it's highly resource intensive and takes away opportunities just as we were talking about for a child to try some, they'll lose an, an elective course because we have to do it on a course-wide basis. So we have to put you in a math strategies or a reading strategies course. So you've lost the opportunity for an elective that you might want to go try something. Now we're trying to take more of our electives. Good example is engineering. We no longer have an engineering elective. Why? It's embedded in the core curriculum in middle school at U32. So it's, it's really trying to say, when kids, when we start to notice that kids are having a struggle with their learning, how do we attack that right away when I'm going to use my hands because I was looking for a piece of paper I could draw on? If this is the learning trigger directory, and this is the directory Bill Kimball's on right now, and I, down in second grade it's right here, and it's not much of a gap to change, but as I get to seventh grade, it's that three grade level I was just talking about. If I don't attack, if I attack it early, and it may take more constant work for Bill, it means more, maybe more time on literacy throughout my elementary and probably high school career, I can still be close, I can still achieve the proficiency standards we've set, but I may not take as much, I might not have to take away as much from other areas to do that. And what we're finding, what our data is showing us, is we aren't getting folks, we aren't getting students to proficiency, especially when that gap gets greater than about a grade and a half level. Now we are seeing schools in our system and grade levels in our system where we're actually counteracting that in elementary school. You know, East Montpelier for the past two years has given us data with their system where they are actually, the learning rates of the students that are at historically disadvantaged and we know are not performing at grade level, they're closing that gap between grades three and six faster than the learning rate of the students of the of the students that aren't in those interventions. So their interventions are working and how they're tackling it. And they're tackling it at a lower grade at a lower age. Any other comments? Yeah, I just want to say that um, uh, I've been reading a lot about this, really enjoying it, specifically focusing on the achievement gap, and it's interesting because now I think there's a little reframing of that to talk about the opportunity gap, which makes sense, right? You know, it's not so much that we blame these kids for not achieving, it's that they haven't had these opportunities. Right. Um, but I also, one thing that's really come out a lot is that there's a whole lot of literature around student engagement, and especially how important it is for kids who are... Um, who are you know, students who struggle or are perhaps from historically disadvantaged groups. And so I, I really hope that that, you know, that that hasn't been part of our conversation so far, and I hope that that can really inform our conversation. And you know, I can, I'm, there was a big report came out that came out recently, I think it's called The Opportunity Gap. I know, Katie Farber, are you back there? I know you kind of specialize in some of this. Is there any reading you suggest that we do? Oh, my, there's so much happening in this conversation that it's been, mm -hmm. there's a, a lot on my mind. Um, I was just lately thinking about what Bill was saying with integration, you know, really thinking about how how a lot of every, what people are saying is, is really in common. And to me, drilling back and thinking about the, at the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about um, Marzano and looking at, um, like, the number one thing he was saying is having a safe and collaborative culture, mm -hmm. right, and how important that is and, like, the fact that it felt like some of this has been talked about maybe before. Some of the staff had heard about it. I just wonder, wonder about that part of it, and and if that's, you know, how that can be improved. And then I'm doing a lot of reading about collective efficacy and thinking about how a part of that is really teachers feeling like they're um, helping shape the direction and the climate and fostering a really rich and dynamic space for all students to be successful. And if like they're not feeling collective efficacy or a collaborative culture that they've been part of that decision making 
So my, I'm kind of swirling around that and a little bit away from the engagement presently in my mind. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the engagement stuff is really just like strong relationships with your teachers, you know, stu between students and teachers. I mean, it's about behavioral and emotional engagement and cognitive engagements of different types. And so I guess that's a forest for the trees thing, right? Like, whatever we're talking about with literacy and math has to have a high level of engagement. And we know that comes from a lot of places, like doing things not just for the teacher. It's not just like, it's not like disposable work. It's work that has a wider audience. It's work that's, you know, presented to people that are either, in, you know, that, that um, know about that topic or that can give feedback about that topic. It's about, um, Creativity. I mean, it's, it's about so many things, and so I guess I'm just thinking about all of that. There's a ton of data about engagement and impact on student learning and achievement. I mean, there's just so much of it. So, if, you know, it, it, it's um, there's so much commonality in what we're all talking about, and it's it's unclear to me like, what does the guarantee mean? Are we only talking about improving SPEC scores in math and science? Like, is that what we're talking about? And is that does that have to be just couched in math and science, or can these be expansive, integrated? Um, explorations that can bring a lot of the new data about personalized learning and what we know has been successful across the state in tons of schools. We see um, project-based learning and we see service learning happening and we see um, personalized learning plans where kids get to really learn about their own identity and they get to think about their own goals and uh, validating lived experiences outside of the walls of school and ubiquitous learning. So I'm just thinking about all those intersections and wondering how, um, how we can pull them together. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. I'll keep listening. So can I give you your engagement piece? Yeah, I'd love okay, to. Okay, so today, literally today, Jim Knight, probably the best person in the nation around job coaching. We've sent five or eight teachers, week-long in students with them. Ellen Dorsey, if you want something, because her doctor at work is someone on math engagement, Katie, that she's doing at UVM right now. Um, she, uh, the research really looks, in, and Katie was just talking about this, it's called authentic. Um, it's used compliance, we don't like that word, but compliance engagement and uh, non-engagement. is And so the where Alan has some different words which I've forgotten already, but this is what Jim said. We did a quick survey around our table of 12, 15 people from Washington Central today and said, what do we think it is in the school system? And the majority of what we have is compliance engagement. We don't have authentic engagement. And back to exactly what you were saying, Katie, about project-based, personalization. As a young kid for me, if you had asked me to read something, I would say, no way. But if you had put something that was in front of me that had to do at the point I was building go-karts when I was 10 to 12 years old, I probably would have devoured it, especially if we know like a Brigham Stratton, Stratton um, operation manual has about a grade level reading of about 12 or early college because I was so interested in it. And that's true for any kid. It's the purpose. It's the purpose. And so back to the integrated unit, back to, I mean, you're right. I totally agree with what Katie's saying here. It's that personalizing program. And I know Amy agrees with that, because Amy's done a lot in project-based learning. So it's, you know, those are the things that we need to get to. Because that, we need to be in that area. Okay. So, just two things real quick. First thing I want to say is that this is why we had the retreat. Uh, was to have that so that we would be having this conversation. Um, you know, I literally, literally could dance if I was a different person, I'd be dancing right now, just listening to this. Uh, we haven't been having it. Um, and the second thing is just, I really want to stress that um, the conversation is not just about what do we want to be as a school system, what do we want to hold our, the school system accountable to, but what do we want to, we as board members want to hold ourselves <laughs> accountable to. And what I mean by that is, um, we want to make sure that we understand and we are giving you the resources that you need um, to help kids, to help kids learn. Um, and I think that we, we don't necessarily we put ourselves in that position always to, if, if someone comes to us and says, well, what we really need is a, a job coach or we need a specialist here or we need this or that. Um, you know, we don't always have the context for understanding the request. Um, we, have, we haven't always set up the parameters of, of saying, well, this is what we're going to achieve. <coughs> and so that we feel the pressure when someone comes and says, well, if you want us to achieve that, this is what we need. And we say, well, we got to go sell it to the community. we got to go tell uh, the legislature and AOE that they need to, you know, if they're looking at a policy change, they have to think about this um, so that we can be more effective in our role um, at, 
as well, um, and maybe a better, a better service, I think, to, to educators. Okay. So. And just to say one thing, um, I was just giving this presentation about service learning and um, its impacts on personal growth, and there was about a table full of 10 people, and four of them said that they do service learning only with their gifted population. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay. And so then I went and did some reading about that. And what we end up doing in this country a lot is taking our historically marginalized groups and doing very shallow education with them, right? Like rote facts, memorize this, this is a new program you're gonna achieve, and we maybe achieve some rote, um, very limited successes in a one to three year window. But, but the current research, like out of Stanford about deeper learning, it's really about you know, this authentic engagement and, and this authentic audience and this relevant purpose. And um, for real deeper learning, what, what I don't want to see happen with this guarantee is a commitment to some real shallow memorization work. Yeah. <laughs> and that we may, yeah, we'll see a bump for a year or two in something that's maybe you know, some algorithmic math successes on the SVAC or ability to spit out a summary, say, on the SVAC. You know, that's not deeper learning. That's not going to help prepare our kids for, you know, the future economy and these skills that they're going to need, these real transferable skills. So I'm um, just, I'm wondering about that tension between the guarantee and making sure that, that what, if that ever comes to fruition, that that is really about deeper learning and not um, just going ahead and continuing the same um, hierarchies of power and oppression that happen to these historically marginalized groups um, all the time. Um, I just also want to say in terms of engagement and how well children can or cannot, regardless of what their um, learning abilities are, <coughs> I've had children speak to me about feeling overwhelmed in the classrooms because they feel like they're too big. And I know that some of these are practical issues of space and teaching staff and what have you, but um, I had a child say specifically, it's too much hurry, it's too many people, and it's too loud. And that child having a hard time really being able to engage because it just feels like it's too much. And I had two children last year that I worked with who had felt the same thing in the classroom that they were in. They're in classrooms this year that aren't quite as large and not quite as chaotic in terms of all the need in the classroom and they're doing so much better and feeling more able to engage and be present. So there are lots and lots of considerations to be made when we talk about how we can best serve the children in terms of their learning and in terms of outcomes, in terms of their ability to engage with the work and with the um, classroom as a whole. I want to get this on kind of in this discussion so it can be in the minutes. Um, but now we've had multiple people talk about depth of learning, whole child, um, being able to learn from other things besides math and literacy, not just measuring SBAC scores, and talking about kids feeling uncomfortable. And so I, I want to point out that, you know, this is my fault. Like, I, I mean, I put in there literacy and math, but the other parts of Amy's presentation that she gave now and that she's given previously is describing how our staff members and how our principal have been working hard and effectively to try to help the social emotional dynamics in our school and with all of our kids. So our busing is doing better. We used to have all these bus incidents and my own kids were constantly involved in it. Like, I get the call from Remy again. <laughs> what has he done now? And it, but it was both ways and that has gone down. Um, I have a child that needs some extra attention in the social emotional world and the staff has been unbelievable in trying to, to help him learn by dealing with that part of it. And so. I'm not giving you guys good data, but I really want you to know that our staff is really addressing that, to, to the best of my understanding, really effectively, like Julie, trying to help these kids find a space that is going to work for them. And so I hope to make sure that that's out there, I guess. Um, we will be in touch um, and about a further conversation, which will hopefully lead to action as opposed to just discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the goal, I think, will be board, um, staff, community, administration, um, all in one room at the same time. Talk about, you know, it will be a guaranteed discussion 
um, but just what the what we're talking about here, and it, it will, as it did tonight, branch off into a lot of different areas, uh, which have been great. Oh, I, I think the guarantee is kind of the proposal that's been on the table, but I would also really encourage people to come with alternate proposals because, you know, we, I have kind of a sense of the literature, but it would help a lot to have a concrete vision of, okay, here we've got a guarantee, here we've got, you know, sort of a menu of three or four choices, rather than talking about the guarantee and, you know, it's kind of like that Act 46. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Tom, less, less yeah, word. Yeah. I, well, one, to get that information, I don't think I've seen the survey. Right, no. so... Okay. I don't know what I can do with it. We, so yeah, that's a good point. Let's have this yeah. about you. So you got survey responses? So yes, and I didn't know after the potential breach of policy, I didn't know what to do. Like I didn't feel comfortable then forwarding that information, but I have the survey results and there's lots of really considerate responses about these issues that I think people would like to hear. So I'm not sure what, what, like, what can I do with those? I was going to forward them to the board and hope that we could talk about them tonight. We don't really have time for potential. So I've, I mean, for me as a board member, I don't want to look at it as a data point until I'm sure that at least people in the community had equal access to filling it out. So um, what you said was it was on Front Porch Forum and Facebook. And it's been a few years since we um, had this discussion, but we did a lot in terms of gathering information about um, like how many families had access to email and internet and those types of things. So I, um, I think that we need to discuss if we're going to look at the survey and use it as a data point. And if we are, then we need to distribute it the way that we agreed, was it two years ago, two and a half years ago, that we would distribute information, which was... Um, I feel like it was to use email for everybody who had email, and for people in the school who we knew didn't have email, we would mail them a hard copy. Um, so personally, I'm not comfortable looking at the community results until we do access to uh, at least that that we agreed to. It's not, it's, it wasn't a procedure or a policy, it was just what we all agreed was best practice. In terms of the staff, I mean, we can discuss my, I guess my preference would be that we all agree on a survey and we send one out together. Um, but that's just... And I didn't even get it on Front Porch Forum. I didn't either. Yeah, I, I am behind on a couple, but I think... So I've never think seen it. Okay. No, okay, so it sounds like that. maybe we redo the survey. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. So Chris, can I make a suggestion? Sure. Allison, why don't you, you and I have worked together well before. Why don't the two of us work on it? I think there's some context that we can, I think that, like I said, the intent is really good in the, what we're trying to do here. But I think if we can tweak some of the introduction and then get it out and get, you know, get that out to folks and let them have it out and have it back by December and have all that for the board, would that work? Were we going to schedule a different meeting, though, and, to have it yes. after school? And, I, and I'm thinking early December, actually, mm -hmm. before the holiday, but for the Thanksgiving. So. Um, so you you want to work with Bill on, on just tweaking what you already have, Allison? Um, that's great, and uh, I just want to make sure I can forward it. I mean, it's really even public information. I don't know if I should share it publicly, but there were some just lovely ideas that people had. I mean, very much I, in the same vein I, I, as. I don't think you throw them out. You don't. No, throw okay. them out. You, you just include them in the next. But I'm saying we're going to make a version two. Great. Okay. For the community, and there's some resources we can give them. That will broaden because I think tonight we went a lot deeper. And for those who saw yeah. the survey and what you heard tonight, I saw some, I had some affirmation from those of you that did that, hey, I hear a different context now than what I did in the survey. And I think context is so important when you ask people information to give you back feedback, whether it's in a thin format like it is here in a survey or thick as we've been doing tonight, where there's a conversation going on, so that we really have that set. So, because I, I would love to have more feedback of like, what does the community think about this? You know, and that's what you were, you, when you reference goals, to me, the, as your superintendent, the goals, you did that in your student learning outcomes and in the mission you wrote. And so then we start talking about, um, you know, what are action steps and what are indicators or, or sub-goals underneath that. I just want to make sure we don't lose it. Lose no, no, we're not losing. No, I don't think we should lose it. I agree with you. Oh, well, but just to get that public participation and input 
for people to spend time doing that, we have to feel like it actually matters. And I've heard an amazing amount of wonderful ideas from everyone on this side of the room. But you seven are the ones who actually have the power to make changes in this building. And there have been a number of huge changes made to this building, like with the scheduling this year, that I think we're done without community input and without teacher input. And it, that's very troubling to me. And it, I just think you need to think about that. Are you actually going to act on what the community wants, on community members saying, we want allied arts, we want whole child at Romney, or is at the end of the day the supervisory union going to make the decision because statutorily they're uh, tasked with that? So here's my hard direct question I've asked the board, Kyle. When you have limited resources and time, is there a priority list or isn't there? And I really want the answer either way. I'm not saying I want that I'm, I'm conditioning. I have my own opinion on that, but I think the board should make that decision. And that's part of that guarantee discussion. You know, for, for children, where do we, and a lot of that goes into a conversation with the parents. Well, ask the board, do you support whole child learning at Romney? Um, you know what that is? We'll, we'll have that discussion at this meeting. Um, and I think the answer is yes, but what does that mean too? I mean, because it's, it's a broad question, Kyle. I mean, who's gonna say no? You know, right? <laughs> who's gonna say no to that? But so. what was, uh, and I wasn't at the last meeting, but I did watch it on video. I don't remember it coming up. What is the intention with the survey and what we'll do with the information? Is it to help us with deciding about a student guarantee? Is it to help with mm -hmm. what? Yeah. So I'm reasonably new to this, which is why I'm sure I make lots of mistakes. But, um, but every meeting we've, I think every meeting we've had, we've talked about like goals and priorities and how would we make a priority list to delegate resources and what is it that, and I don't really, I feel like these are these soft questions and that we don't ever really, I'm not quite sure how to explain it. It's like it's always there, but nothing ever really comes of it. And so then, then we had this meeting at the WCSU where it seemed like we were really going to try to work on those questions. And then my understanding was we were going to follow them up here. And so I felt really under the gun, like this is happening so fast. How are we possibly going to get our community involved in this at, with that kind of speed? And so all that we were all, the goal of what I sent out was to try and just get people's opinion exactly what has happened here tonight that's all i wanted i wanted people who can't come don't come won't come don't feel comfortable coming whatever i wanted them to be able to you know put out their opinion so we can start to feel oh wow you know everybody's actually interested lots of people are interested in this or no you know people are really interested in focusing on the academics or or you know they have ideas that we should be doing whatever and so does that answer your question um I don't know. So is it for us to then make our own goals and priorities? Is it for the board to do board work? It is to inform the board so that we can do board work. Okay. And, and I think it's to get community input. Yeah. Get, get information from the community and staff input um, yeah. into the curriculum issues. Right. So that we can no. start. And I don't feel like we can prioritize if we don't know what are some of the things that are happening and being proposed and what are people thinking about. Like how can... So like prioritizing our work plan? So our work plan, I feel like that's something different. That to me is Bill knows that X is going to happen in December and Y is going to happen in February. And so we need to like plan what we're going to do at each of our meetings to try to make oh, our it's meetings more, like more, a more efficient. So schedule. That feels, that's a schedule. Like a calendar. But this is a priority. So <coughs> when any questions come up of funding, we now have something that we have agreed upon. We have decided we're going to focus on this. So if we have to decide on funds for A, B, or C, well, this is what we decided our, our goals and priorities are, so this is how we would deal with that. Does that, am I like misinterpreting what we've no, been I kind think, of softly think, talking yeah. about? I softly. So I w would suggest to Allison and Bill who are going to work on this, that's what needs to be said in the survey so that when people are filling it out, they know that that's their chance to give input onto the work for the board and prioritizing funding mm -hmm. and a lot of what was said those are pretty big things that you know if yeah. I'm somebody who's super busy I'm gonna take the time to do that survey because that's my opportunity okay. versus 
not knowing what the intention is or how the data will be used. Um, we have traditionally had differences in opinion, and I feel like oftentimes I differ from what Brian and Caroline are saying. Would you guys feel better about one of you making the survey? Um, I'm totally happy. I mean, if you want to do that, great. Otherwise, I'm happy to put in the time and then, of course, see what you guys think about it before. But what's going to be the most comfortable for you? So it sounds like you've already done a lot of the work. Um, and I, I would say I think we can. I think to between two it, of us, Allison, we can. I, mean, I think what Caroline and I'm answering for her, so I'm sorry. I shouldn't be jumping in. You had a direct question, but Caroline asking the question you just did. That's the best part of a, a well-written survey is what's the intended use for it and what's the information you're trying to gather. Okay. So I think having that up front and then really it's more of a link more to the work we're trying to do that's up on the Washington Central website. That's what I'd want to point out. Okay. Uh, I, I'm no, sorry. I just, I just want to respond. Oh. Um, as I communicated to you in, in my email is that I thought the intent was good. I was concerned around the process. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if you want different content or something, then I'm happy to pass it over. But I'd have to see it. I have no idea, but I think you and Bill working together. Okay. So okay. just so I'm super clear, are you going to agree on this content and then send it out, or are you going to agree on this content and bring it back to the board? Bring it back to the board, I think. Just so can we do that by email? Because we can't. Otherwise, we have to wait till the next meeting. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I wonder if I you can just empower you. the two of us I to shift the. Okay. It's really. It's not shifting the questions. It's just shifting the front, the preamble. Before the survey, I think really, and then and giving okay. people some resources to look at if they'd like to, because so it's based because it's hard with a, it's hard with any electronic survey. Sometimes you can't preview the questions before you take them, and you need to know a few things. So you have to put that in the beginning, and here are some resources you might want to avail yourselves of, of what we're talking about. Joe? I just wanted to make one clarifying statement that the survey was literally completely open ended. It was just. What are your ideas for best practices, and what are your goals for students? It was there were no, there was no like choose A or B or C or D or I strongly agree. It was literally two open-ended questions, so which is probably why you got like long paragraphs. So I just want to make sure people that Amanda yeah. Allison has developed right. some survey that's statistically accurate. It was two completely open-ended questions. That was the whole survey. And out of that, so it'll be in the. I, I'm not planning yeah. on changing it. Right. I, I'm so, just more. But my more concern is that, that the preamble is really could important. Could be clarified, and yeah. you probably, and you will, you probably would get different results based on the preamble. I would, I would totally agree with that. But I just want to make sure that people didn't think there was some big long, you know, forty question survey. It was just two open ended questions. Next, next. Um, next I time. just wanted to say, Allison, whether you made mistakes in the way that you did it and, and I didn't get to, I really appreciate that you took the time and that you reached out to find out what we were thinking because we've been feeling like we're not necessarily being heard or consulted about things that are really, really important. So hopefully I'll get the next one. Well, it's very sweet of you. I definitely am not alone doing credit. I think everybody here really wants to know what the staff have to say. Oh, I'm sure of it actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, we talked a lot before about the communication between board and the community and staff and central office and administration, and somehow it just feels like it just keeps falling by the wayside. And I really, really, really wish and hope that we would start to communicate because if we're communicating effectively and appropriately with each other, we can then start to build on these other things that are so essential for the children's education and well-being. If we're not communicating, we can't do that as effectively. So I appreciate that the reaching out happened. And maybe next time I'll get the starving. <laughs> so do we um, need a break? Wait, do, first of all, are well, we empowering I, them? What? Are we empowering yeah. them to send it yeah. out? Um, I think come to us. First, just so we know what this being By sent email. out, okay. and then <coughs> just so you for information, just not for it. No, I just want to be clear. I yeah. want to be yeah, clear. Yeah. Second, um, you've had some folks waiting to talk to you yeah, about yeah. the building, and, okay, and so. I know you want to give a break, but I think we should. I would recommend to you, Chris, that you okay about the building use. I, I feel. Does, has everybody had their say? 
They're all it's about the Okay. okay. Yeah. So next up <laughs> is the um, building use. We're going to take up uh, building use next. Um, and um, I think we'll, we'll call on um, the building access yeah. first. Yes. So yes. Sally, yes. you want to just introduce yourself, please? Yes, um, my name is Sally Cavanaugh, and um, I'm on the, the spaces and there's some places. The spaces and um, events committee that came out of What's Next Middlesex. And there are a number of us here in the room who are on this committee. And we wanted to come to the board because one of the more exciting, there were several exciting ideas that came out of that day's work having to do with spaces um, in, in our town where people want to feel more connected and, and have access to for a variety of different reasons. And some of the really exciting uh, ideas right at the top revolved around Romney. So what would Romney be, what could Romney be to the community after school hours in terms of either adult education or cultural heritage presentations or a speaker series or um, ideas like recreation, you know, indoor volleyball um, has come up, musical presentations, these types of things. So we wanted to bring this to you. We're, we're having our first meeting on Tuesday night. What we'd like to do is form some kind of a survey, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, so some kind of survey to uh, check out what people in the community would like to see for uses of the Romney facility. Um, we've also checked out the procedures for the policy that governs the use of the facility as of 2014. It seems like it's a good mix and a good fit, um, but we kind of wanted to check out, you take your temperature, um, we're, we're going to be talking about it at our meeting on Tuesday night about how do we do some outreach and, and what would be some good uses that we could consider for this building um, in the future. And then Elliot's going to talk a little bit more about one point of that under his other cap, which is the bandstand committee cap, but he's also on this committee. So we, I wanted to give you the broader context and see if you have any input for us to consider. I just, I have a question. So you looked at the current facility use policy uh -huh. or whatever it's called yeah. and, and what you want to do fits within that? It seems to. The only thing that we came up with that was a question for us was if you're members of this community using the facility for some of the uses that I just outlined, there's the insurance piece of that, which I don't know how that would apply to members of the town. I don't know how that would work, but and, and we don't know, but that would be something we probably need some more, you know, advice there, on. Are there areas that we can't use? And then, Amy, what burden does this put on me or me, you know, maintenance like that? We would need to know logistically really mm -hmm. what, it, what, how that's going to impact you. Yeah, so we just wanted to put it out there to you that we'd like to have your input as we start to talk and work things out. Um, and before we go out with some questions that might be something that you feel is a little bit you know, not something that you think is a good idea. So I, I, uh, I think we should make the school as accessible as possible to a middle-sized community and um, anyone who wants to come in and use it. Uh, I think what I could foresee as being um, issues that we have to grapple with is what spaces would that be? Would it be limited in spaces? Uh, we would have to get uh, teacher input as to um, if classrooms were going to be used, uh, what would need to be done in order to ensure that uh, student data is secured um, and issues like that. I think we'd also, um, I, you know, I, I must say, I, I would, you know, if, if it um, was a staffing, like custodial staffing issue, that we would have to work and, and want, I would hope we would want to work around that because ultimately uh, the taxpayers fund this entire building uh, mm -hmm. to uh, quite a bit, and we have did over the past couple of years, and so uh, and I think during, you know, during the rehab there was a, a push of using the building more as mm -hmm. community like center. Fund, right? uh, yes. We have the vote, we have town meeting here now, and so mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, Romney School is a social center for yeah. the town of Middlesex. Yes. I think a lot of people meet here when they, you know, because their kids come here and they end up parents run into each other, and and it, it really is a the. Um, the glue pot, I think, yeah. that creates a lot of
contacts. So maybe um, and encouraging so, what? us to open, so encouraging us to open up the discussion uh, across town and ways we can uh, talk about as, as, as to what much would be as uses you could might think of would be a great use for Romney to right. ask people to be creative in their own. Right, roles. as much as possible, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, again with the, the limitations yeah. that we have, yeah, um, right. and and just work around those. Well, we bring some feedback, obviously, to you. So I just wanted to let you know that we're going to be starting and. It's Tuesday yep. night, so we wanted to get here. Yep. And then I'll just turn it over to, um, unless anybody else from the committee has anything else to add, I'm just going to turn it over to Elliot, who's got a specific piece for us. Um, Chris, may I just add one thing? Absolutely. It, it might be helpful for the board to review the policy um, and procedures again, just mm -hmm. because I could see there's sometimes impromptu use of the building, and I would really like it to be spelled out where the priority needs to be. So for instance, if, if a practice needs to be moved into the gym, and you know we had thought that it was open for gym vo volleyball or something like mm -hmm. that, who gets priority? I the would, students I would, or you know the community group? Is it first come, first serve mm -hmm. as far right as now scheduling? It's, it's in the principal, it's in your, basically the principal's discretion, right? Right, to make and I would decision. just want that you a would, little bit clearer as in the so policy that, yeah. Yeah, so that it's not um, so, so that it's clear to everybody. So, yeah, how some that's of, gonna roll. some of our other policies at our other schools mm -hmm. lay it out that student use is first. You know, they just they, it's just listed <coughs> right out. It's yeah. it it helps with the administrator saying, okay, I have got a conflict here. Who do I serve first? Mm -hmm. And I would, I, you know, I think the group of fairness is students first. Um, you know, yeah. and that would just I think that would. If, and if there's going to be a question about, I don't think there's any question about that. No, um, because no, it's it's usually not the student piece. Yeah, yeah. it I'm usually comes either. between, and I, I'm just going to be very direct at concrete instance, uh, at other schools because the fields are owned by Rumney Town right. out there. But we've had at some schools Onion River scheduled to have the field, and this community group <coughs> who's in town wants to have the field. Who do you, and and Onion River set in the time to sign up started six months prior and they mm -hmm. signed up the day of six months. Who do you, you know, how do you how do you walk that, yes. you know? And so That's there are con. It's not. I think it, it's back to that being clear about what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you said this already, Chris. It's just we want to ensure we put a lot of money into this building, so it's staffing the use of it. To make sure we get it locked up and it's kept clean, Absolutely. and I, that's just something we we've, we've learned by not doing that in other buildings, yeah. that it's not because anyone's trying to be mischievous. Things just happen. It's just yeah, the way it is. That actually is a really good point too. Just to think, not that anything's being planned now, but the schedule of who has the building is that Alyssa. We've already been working on gathering that information for your group so that you have some idea of okay. when it's typically being used and okay. how frequently and by what queries. Elliot? Thank you. I'm Elliot Berg uh, from the Bandstand Committee. Yep. Uh, Mary Nealon is here from the committee. John Puglio was here, but had to be. Um, one of the other ideas that came up at the What's Next Middlesex gathering was uh, the possibility of enhancing the gym here so that it is easily convertible into a performance space. And um, I'm here in particular to ask the board for your support for a partnership with the bandstand committee to do an initial acoustical study. And I'll give you the background on that. First of all, let me say um, the bandstand is entering its 14th season this next year. I, I'm hoping all of you or most of you have gone to concerts there. And a perennial issue has been, when it rains, where do we go? And for the first 10 years, we had the benefit of coming here to the Rumney School and using the gym. But the, the problem was that the acoustics and the lighting of the gym are uh, they're problematic, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, about four years ago, we decided not to do it anymore because it just it didn't work as a performance space. Um, but there is a way of enhancing the gym so that you could do that. Um, Mary and 
Ron Sweet from the Bandstand Committee and I had a, uh, a meeting with Don Hirsch from Middlesex here at the gym. And if you don't know Don, uh, he's sort of a community resource in this. He's a theater designer. He did the Paramount Theater in Rutland, the Barry Opera House. And he uh, took an hour of his time. We did this walkthrough of the gym and he said that what we needed were acoustical improvements, stage lighting, and ideally a foldable stage or in sections that could be stored where the chairs are right now. <coughs> and we talked about that in some detail and he sketched out what kind of lighting would be needed and he costed that out for us. Um, he, he got us uh, some prices on staging. It's the acoustical piece that we have a, an initial step to do because you have to have an acoustical engineer come in and study the space. You need to figure out how many panels, how many curtains, how they're designed, and then we can get a cost for that. And so uh, we tried to envision a situation where we would have a, a sort of win-win-win outcome for the town. It's a win because we have town meetings, like town meeting and other get-togethers. Uh, when we did the What's Next Middlesex meeting the other week, it was really hard to hear people speaking there. Even the person up front couldn't hear her. Uh, it would be a win for the school because of plays and concerts. You would have a space that would, um, would honor the work that the kids are doing. And it would be a win for the community in terms of bandstand concerts. So. Uh, <coughs> Here's, here's sort of the lineup on this. Uh, we need to have, we would need to have an acoustical engineer come in and study the space. And Don Hirsch estimates that the cost of that would be somewhere in the five to six thousand dollar range. Now I know that may sound like a lot for a study, but the person has to come in and figure out what kind of paneling, what kinds of curtains, what the design would be. At that point, we can get a hard cost on acoustical improvements. We know what the staging costs. We know what the lighting costs, uh, plus installation. The, the overall package, the best estimate we have right now is around $50,000. And the bandstand committee has gone to the community before, outside of tax dollars, to build a bandstand. Um, Fourteen years ago, we built the bandstand with no, no money from the town, no money from the school, community labor, and community donations. And so we're looking to, to partner with the school board to, uh, to make the gym the kind of space where all of these uses, this is part of mm -hmm. sort of the what's next middle sex impetus in the direction of fuller use of the Rumney building Accessible. to make it the kind of space that we can all use. I wonder if you have any, any questions about this. Um, do you have an acoustical engineer in mind? I'm sorry? Do you, do you have an estimate on that it would be five to 6,000, or is that uh, Don Hirsch Don's has been trying to get in touch with their acoustical engineers in White River and Boston, is my understanding, and he's waiting to hear back from them. So I had hoped we had hoped to have a number for you tonight, whether it was four or five or 5,500 or whatever. Um, the, the bandstand would be willing to split that cost with you. If it were $5,000, for example, we would put $2,500 down. And, and just see, there's no commitment beyond the study. But without the study, we can't figure out what the overall cost and design would be. So. It's very different than the discussion you all had earlier, I understand. It's, it's very concrete. It's, this is this very one. easy one. Beth has a question. I'm sorry, Beth. Um, I wonder, Elliot, if you could add in um, the acoustical study addressing the sort of daily use here at Romney, because the that space can be really challenging yeah. when it's full of kids for lunch. And when it's when they're having um, physical education, it can be really challenging, I think, for some kids mm -hmm. to be in that um, space. So if if 
that was included to understand how to make that better for the kids. Yeah, too. in terms of echo and that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm sure the engineer would take that into effect. I mean, we, we would we would be laying out, you know, all of the uses that the gym would be made of. And um, yeah. I just wonder when we when we did our um, the budget for the new improvements of the school. The gym came up as one of the the improvements, and it was tabled. And I was just wondering if we ever were going to readdress that to have a space for the community, a nice gym, great acoustics, um, staging, more more space for storage and tables. If that's something we will ever readdress. Well, Lauren, that's what I was thinking too, because I was like, the floor. <laughs> uh, I was right there. I thinking about your use of it as the, our physical education teacher and the storage we have, um, I mean, I would want, I think we, we, I'm not trying to, I think we should do the acoustical study, but I think we should engage our, our architects, Black River Design, um, because they're the ones who can plan out multiple uses of spaces. And is this actually able to have all that equipment It'd be great to use all that space, but to be able to say, is this actually going to work, or are we looking for an addition or something different to be able to do all this? And I don't know. I mean, I just, that's why we hire these guys to do the work they do for us. Yeah, I mean, it's my understanding in terms of the acoustics that we're talking about, probably talking about acoustic paneling around the top of the walls. Yeah. And you can't put paneling down below because of basketball and other sports, but there are curtain systems, acoustic curtain curtain systems that you can use there. Yeah. The stage lighting would be fixed up above. Yeah. That so actually, all that doesn't really concern me. Okay. It's the um, risers and portable stage. Right now we're keeping our stage out in containers because mm -hmm. we we'd like to have it inside. Um, so it's, and when I think about the space that's behind the screen slash curtain area that has chairs and tables in there for when Lauren's teaching, it's yeah. pretty full in there. Yeah. So there's not more room, and so it's we have to think about we need we need an architect slash space designer to think about how do we do all that, and I wouldn't want to get too far down the road without asking that question. I think there are doables, and just to do a quick quick estimate, what would that cost us to to be able to provide all that? Well, this is I mean, this, I think we're looking at a much more significant project because we've already we've already talked about. Um, sort of as a five-year plan of uh, building improvement, the gym being yeah. one of the, you know, big ticket items that we need to take, want to take care of uh, within that five-year window. And I believe that alone was, we're talking 50 to 75. That was just a floor. I thought the, just a floor. Just a floor. Just a floor. I mean, painting 000. is 25, 30,000. Right. So, that. but what I'm also thinking, I, I, I felt like there might, if we're looking at a larger project, does the design of the gym, what, uh, does that, you know, whatever that might look like, will that impact the acoustical study? Will it change, you know? Um, and so, turning to Bill's point, this might, this, we may want to think sort of bigger picture with this uh, as well, because if there are further improvements that need to be made to the gym, will that need to be taken into account Prior to doing the acoustical study, so you're getting the most, we're getting the most accurate one. I don't, I don't know exactly how that would work. Um, what would be improved? But. I think one of the questions we had what is, um, what is the potential impact of Act 46 on this kind of vision for the for the gym? Um, are we looking at a situation in which um, the middle of next year? Um, whatever funds might be available now to put toward this project would end up being pooled among the five uh, district towns. And I, I don't know the answer to that, but... I'm pretty confident uh, the answer is yes. Um, that if, if there was a merger, um, you know, part of the merger is all debt and all assets go merged into the single entity, and then any decision like that would not be by this board, it would be by um, a, the, the entities board um, and so the, the answer is I think yes uh, that, that we wouldn't be sitting here making a decision on that and we wouldn't be using uh, or at least we wouldn't be the ones using the, the funds that may be available now uh, because they, they get all merged into a single pot 
Join. Do, do you disagree with that, Bill? No, I think you're you're in the right area, but I don't I don't say that precludes it either. I, I wouldn't say it does. does I don't even say it either way. I wouldn't want right. to say either way. Well, but it's a it different decision harder. making. It's, 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 yeah, and I think you covered that very well. Right. And I think there's I don't know I I don't know the answer is what I usually say to people. Right. I don't know. We're not there. There might be a window of opportunity. Now right. is what I'm suggesting. Join. My my question about Act Forty Six was. If we merge, we don't own the building, right? I thought we had to sell the building. And that's the point. For is that's dollar. that's so an asset that will. Not, yeah, we actually yeah. wouldn't even own it, right? right. So, who would we? We wouldn't even be able to get permission from. Well, no, well, you I know, the assets. I, I mean, we'd have to go to a different entity to get permission. Yeah. Well, it depends. Uh, you know, we talked to, we talked a little bit about this during the um, uh, what's yeah. next Middlesex and and my. Suggestion was that um, building access be written into the Articles of Agreement. Could be uh, so that local there's local control over that, not the not this board control. And, and um, Adrian took the tact of saying, "I think it'd be good faith on all parts because everyone else would want to have access to their building right, as well." Right. I, I think, and, and I agree with that to the extent that I'd rather see it in writing. Um, um, just <laughs> the just lawyer in you. The <laughs> lawyer in me. Um, the lawyer so in that is the lawyer in me. But it's uh, also and and merge districts have done that. I mean, they've done improvements to single buildings with town work. Um, well, they would have to. Yeah, because it's all part of the building. That's all part of the community. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah right. I don't see that. Yeah, Kyle. Uh, but we should keep in mind that context. We're bringing the second largest. Uh, bond debt into the merger if it happens. So that merge board where we have either one out of seven seats or maybe two out of ten, depending on how it goes, uh, the likelihood that that merge board would want to do improvements to this building when you've got other towns like Callis and Worcester, which have zero debt and their taxes go way up when the merger happens, I, I don't think we're going to be first in line. Um, so do you think that's part of the consideration? If we were going to make an improvement to this building, I'd do it while we have a school board. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering if it's possible to get a sense of the board's view on the acoustical study, um, taking into account what Brian was talking about in terms of, and, and Beth, in terms of multiple uses of the gym, maybe working with Black River Design in terms of what changes might be made to the gym so that we can get this started. If we don't do the acoustical study, we're sort of stuck. Right. I'm very supportive. I think it's a great idea. Thanks for taking that on. Um, I, I also would be supportive of it, but couple it with uh, with working with Black River so that <coughs> you're not putting, you take the proper steps because of other improvements that may be made to the space. You know, I actually would not envision any Adding up, like enlarging it anyway, because it's kind of well, hard to do. If that. you're going to, well, what I heard, yeah. if you're going to bring in other equipment, like staging and uh, and some sort of risers for people for seating, you're going to need to store that stuff somewhere. And right now, our only option is either adding more containers or putting it outside. And so I think we're going to have that issue. Um, I, I don't think it's insurmountable, but I think it, from the way I see this building, this building's still very tight on space. Mm -hmm. It is definitely If I could just tight. clarify at least the, uh, Don Hirsch's um, recommendation in terms of seating and, and viewing was initially the bandstand committee had come in and talked about risers in the back and people can, yeah. can sort of look over in a, in a sloped way to the the performance area, and Don said a much easier uh, approach would be to get foldable staging so that people are sitting on a flat floor, but the performers are raised. Oh yeah, and no, I, I agree. There is foldable staging yeah. that will will fold pretty pretty small. So we we have a set of this at U thirty two that we use. Foldable, and I know, uh, foldable, foldable staging and foldable stage. We use it for graduation. We've actually purchased our own right now. We did it last year and. Um, it folds. I haven't been down to the space for a little while, so I'm not going to say my memory's the best. But knowing what's in that cubby area, for lack of better words, the cubby area, I don't see that going in there. Plus, what's in there when you have all the tables and chairs? Uh, We're just looking at a 20 by 24. Yeah, that's about the same foot uh, area, and it's 
So right. it's not that it's not doable. You got to <coughs> you have to figure this stuff out. Right. And so I just want to be clear with the board that I think it's worth the acoustical investment, but there's other investments you're going to need to have before you say yes or no, because you're going to want consultation from your architect, which is going to be a cost. Right. And you're going to want to look at there's possible other areas that you may need to use for storage if we're not changing the layout of the building. I'm not saying that is. I just want to alert you to the decisions you're going to need to make. I think it's, I mean, I'm not, I think this could be great. I just think we need to look at it in the context of what else, what are our, what are the other needs too with, within the facility? Um, mm -hmm. And what are, what is, what are our costs right now? We have, um, I think it's like 140,000 right now in our capital improvement fund. 144. Um, and we're about to go look for 65, 60 to 65 of it to go for the so I, I, I just, I think we should, we should incorporate this into a larger conversation just to be um, kind of thoughtful mm -hmm. about it. I mean, I think timing-wise, as we talk about our budget, it's fine, but I would just recommend that. I had one other question. Amy, did we approve last year to heat Lawrence space? Wasn't that, there was an issue with having heat back there, wasn't that one of the, was that one of the issues? That was one of the questions that was not done. Was that not done? No. Uh, I have a space heater. <laughs> it's just in the office, in the yeah. office, the two yeah. offices don't have heat. Yeah. That are back there. Okay. I thought um, we, again, that's. It's part of the boiler project. <laughs> oh, the heating the. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's all one, yeah, I mean, we, we can get back into it when we get to the building pieces. Okay, so that's fair. But there's, I mean, there were things we had to do because we got poor bids last time. Okay. So that's why we put everything off here. But it's in a current plan to get it. It was, in the, the it was in the original RFP, and then remember we got very poor, we got very high expensive bids because we went out so late, yeah. and people were already booked for the summer, so we're looking to go, I mean, RFP is hopefully going out in the next couple of weeks to mm -hmm. at least by December 1st. For next summer to do the boiler work which some stuff we took off because we needed controllers i might as well give you the building report right now we needed to change some of our controllers around here part of, i know that the heat for lauren's office was in there as a as an option to be done and it was based on pricing and the money we had um, and since we didn't do a lot the only thing we've done is done some pump work around here that wasn't that came back from the from um Thomas Mechanical, they had to reinstall some pumps that were done in the original. Okay. Um, we really haven't done much piping. We've done more controls work. Okay. Do you have a sense on where you stand? No, I guess I want Lauren to have heat first, but otherwise. I think that's part of the, the um, boiler bid. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's easy to say <coughs> we're done. We're going to be taking apart some walls okay. to get there, to get our heat. This isn't a job, like a, it doesn't have to do with boilers, but more just of the concept of extending the learning spaces um, by both of these opportunities to partner with you. I just want to bring in that these, these aren't like siloed separate things, right? Like there's a lot of opportunity for students at Rumney mm -hmm. to partner about a film series and yeah. hosting or having um, a dialogue about a shared reading or um, more you know, slam poetry on the stage, um, led by students, um, intergenerational learning and audience, authentic audiences. I mean, there's a, like, and then the, the increased belonging for community members and students here um, from those experiences. So I encourage us not to think about these as separate things, but really as um, just extending the learning space. Mm -hmm. Thank you for expanding. <laughs> um, I guess I do want to say that I fully support putting the language in terms of the merger about the building use. Mm -hmm. I fully yeah. support that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but I really don't want to feel like we are going to be pushed to spend money now because of the shift. So I just wanted to say that. Okay. So is there a sense of the board that we would be willing to um, partner on the acoustical um, aspect? I mean, it's not an action item tonight, but I think we'll take a short poll anyway. Uh, we're partnering on the acoustical. I don't know that we need to because it's 2500 So, so I, I don't think, know that it has to so come from the board. We could go find that in the budget. Yeah. 
if you wanted to allocate general funds because I can't spend beyond the budget without the authority of the uh, reserve funds. I can't spend beyond the budgeted amount or I would need authorization from the board to use reserve funds to do that. Okay, so, but if we um, gave the sense that we wanted to partner on a 50-50 basis up to, and I, I would say up to $3,000. Six is, was the upper, I mean, I don't have a hard number for you. We were trying to get. I'm not. I'm not worried about that. I'm not. I'm not worried about that. You'd be able to handle that. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the budget. And if I, we had assurance that you understand that I'm saying, if we can find it, we will. If we have issues, we'll come back to you. Okay. Yeah. Will this engage Black River? As no, well? it will not. You no, know, no. This is just their, the acoustical study. You will. Um, is there, is there a sense as to whether or not Black River needs to come first or? Well, here's the thing that I know I've worked with John enough with different projects because mm -hmm. he's servicing everywhere in the district except for East Montpelier right now, um, that it's better to have the architect in on the initial than coming out later because sometimes things have to be redone. Um, I don't think that it means that John has to get going first before the acoustical, but I think whoever comes in for the acoustical engineer has to, it's uh, John Hemmelgarten, but John, John Ray Hill is the, if, yeah, John Hemmelgarten does our work, but John Ray Hill is the, uh, who you know in Middlesex, who are one of the partners, they're both partners at Black River Design. Okay. Um, that, uh, that they're in at the beginning of it. Right. It, it's just, it's always better. I've, I've learned the hard way, and it usually costs us more. Okay. So should we also allocate funds for that? For one of the jobs. I don't know. I what don't are know. What doing exactly? I'm sorry. Are we voting on something right now to allocate okay. funds for something? For, I think for we're the doing, doing sense of the board of um, sharing on a 50 50 basis up to $3,000 of, of, as our share um, to have the acoustical study done in the gym. Um, to And that would give information on what further um, modifications would need, what, what equipment would be needed to make further modifications and get it better picture of the global cost, at least as envisioned by the Bandstand Committee uh, for that space. Um, and then that would just give us more information. And you would like the acoustical engineer to touch base with? Yeah, I need to talk. I, I mean, See, I'm sitting here tonight without having known this, so I could have had an answer for you tonight. Um, I need to talk to John and say, John, you've done these types of things before. Do you think this is something that can go ahead? Do you need to be in on the beginning of it? Because he knows all the, the ex, from all the surveys and community forums we had about what we want to do the building, we have all that information about what we wanted to do to the gym that didn't get done. So he may say, Bill, have the acoustical engineer go do it. It's not a big deal. But he may say, I mean, I got caught in one the other day at U32. He's like, hey, you should have called me a little earlier I need I, you, we're going to redo some work that's a couple hours worth of work, you know. And so we have an open, we have them as an honest consultant for the SU that we have an open. So I don't need you to allocate funds. I just don't know how much it's going to be. And that's kind of how start work starts with our architect. You try to figure out, like, what's the total cost going to be. So when we get a hard number on the study, should we just send it to you, Chris, or to? to One of the two of us. One of the two of you. Yeah, we'll take it from there. I have enough authorization if okay. the board's comfortable. Right, because then he can do it within the budget. Yeah, right. Okay. I guess I have a few questions about this. So I'm like so thinking this is such a wonderful idea, but I also, but um, we've been talking about a priority list, and I, I guess I feel a little uncomfortable committing to anything without making our priority list, because what if even $3,000 was needed to be able to meet our priority list for our student achievement goals. So I guess my first question is, Lauren, do you think that the acoustics in the gym are inhibiting you from being able to deal with physical education teaching for our children? And Amy, do you think that the acoustics in the gym are causing any troubles for any other kind of instruction at the school right now? I feel that the point about some sensory stuff is valid um, as far as that space being hard for some kids. Um, I, yeah, I agree. I, there's probably some students that it, it's pretty hard. Um, it even travels down the hall. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> <That's> my classroom. <laughs> it's horrendous. Yeah. 
All right, then I can be in support of that if that would help our kids right now do a better job of learning than I. I mean, the, the cost is going to be on the other side is putting it up and all that. No, right, I because, get it. I just yeah. don't want to, like, you know, I feel like if I can't get behind it, I don't want to say, oh, yeah, go ahead and spend $3,000 on the study. If, mm -hmm. So I just want to let you know where I'm at with it. How many kids can't eat lunch in the cafeteria? That's right. You know, I don't think it's a large number, but really? I know. Trouble to your... Yeah. Um, I know for my child, when she first came, it was she couldn't eat because it's, it was it's too really loud. It's really loud in there. Um, okay. So. All right. So it sounds so, like it'd be great. So I think Michelle will be careful as to whether... This issue would remedy that. I don't know if, you know, it might be good to find that out because it almost sounds like the curtains are the thing, curtain system that may help with that as opposed to the panels up above. So I don't just, just so it's not being oversold uh, beyond what it really can do. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm, I'm assuming the But the study system, might come back with all of that. It, well, I agree. I agree. Mike, but we should specifically ask. <coughs> right. But I think the, the acoustical engineer needs to be talking to people in the school here about how the how the gym is used mm -hmm. and what the issues are, mm -hmm. and maybe come when the kids are eating. Or or well, you would have to go through Amy on that. So they, they would have to go through Amy just to uh, for that. Okay. In terms of access to the school, if kids were here. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, you want to take a short break, five-minute break? Are we not ending at 8.30? <laughs> we could be. <laughs> we could be. But I, I also put eight. You need three of us not to come back. I think, I did yeah, but we said eight. we would always end at 8.30. That was our goal for this year. For you? Monday the 12th. Yeah. We have no school, so I have my kids. Okay. We should do morning, and at this point it has to be the 19th. Oh, that's so late. It can't be then. All right. Um... 14th or 16th in the morning? Oh, 15th is a good day, actually. 15th, I could be flexible. I cannot. <laughs> I have an 8 to 10 and then a 10 to 12. 14 or 16 in the morning? Oh, 14 could happen. Yeah. Hey, let me tell you. Oh, What's morning? Down here. That's That's there. No, 41 is yeah, a prime time? number. I don't want to be um, 41. When you say morning. What, 8? Eight? <laughs> there, but like 8.05 is when I come screeching in from Elmore. No, that works. I can, you know, I just, Based Amy knows. She watches, when they have the leadership team meeting, I always come running in at like five minutes after eight. Let's do 815. Okay. One. Hey, you're yes. Uh, what did I sure. say? 40. Yeah. Yeah, unless you wanted to do it up right, here, right. but yeah. Uh, it's just as close for me to go to your office, so. Yeah, because I mean, I'm coming down to 12, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Chris, we decided to go right to straight to 6.0. All right. Adjourn. Adjourn. <laughs> That's 8.0. Um, okay, so we're back on the um, agenda. Uh, thanks for your time. We want to address the budget next? We need Draft to number approve one. the minutes as well. I'm sorry? Approve the oh, minutes. Approve the minutes. Thank you. Do you mind if we just do some real quick house cleaning of like what we're going to address tonight, what we're not? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great idea. Right. So uh, let me ask, Bill, what do we need to address tonight? Um, we need budget piece. Yeah. I want to inform you on the roof because that's been an ongoing s issue. Um, the rest could, could wait. And what reports do, you, do we need um, from your perspective? I think, um, well, you have the you have Amy's report in here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the executive committee, a quick one on the executive committee budget. Um, and we'd like you to get to 5-1, because right now we're dealing with dual policies. Um, and... I don't think you have to do the appoint the two members. Chris, you and I were going back on this this week, the 46. We didn't really talk about that at the Articles Committee this time after we had done two meetings ago. Right, and, and but the sense was having them in place, giving the timing, the tight timing of... Uh, of, of I would like his input on that. What? 
I'd like Matthew's input on that if he thinks it's tight timing for a study committee to get up and going. For 706? Yeah. 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 You want me to? I just would like, I, I'm giving you a simple question. Do you think it's a tight timeline that we need to get people appointed to that now? Or, because we haven't talked about it for two weeks, but. but assuming the board, the state board. The, 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 a 706 like the, committee. Uh, Art, Act 49, subsection D. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's not a 706 D. Right, right, no, right, no, right. But, but it's like. 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 Right. The, in the, uh, in the, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I, I asked Laura to share this information. She hasn't had a chance to do it yet with the committee. Um, Bill was able to send those questions to AOE, yeah. and their response made it clear that um, that their position is not what we've been operating under. Which What's is their that, position? Their position is that uh, the only thing that's possible is amendments to the default articles, not writing entirely new articles. Okay. Um, so we have to deal with that revelation on their part. Um, our next meeting and talk about you know, what it means and, and I know they're going to be talking about that some more from what I read from Donna was that's going to get passed along and did get passed along to the state board's attorney so yeah. with on, the 14th, on the 14th of November so we'll hear more but I don't think it's as open as we thought it was I agree with Matthew that's why I wanted and it was seem very like explicit like you know there's because there are things that are built into the their default articles, they say, that are essential to the success of carrying out the goals they are charged with carrying out under Act 49, whatever. Um, so if that's the case, there are many articles that we could not amend. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it changes the work of the committee substantially. So, Did they describe, I mean, did her response describe how to get away from the statutory language that talks about a 706B like committee? Which is they pretty clear language. That, they what? Did not, they did not address that particular point. So I was trying not to get any huge piece, but I wanted Matthew's okay. piece on whether we thought, because I don't think it's as fast forward as we thought it was, Chris, based on the relevant pieces. But I'm not trying to well, stop. Well, not if you're amending, right. uh, not if it's an amendment, but the that statutory language about <coughs> drafting is 90 days. I understand. I mean, that. that's a fast forward, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's 90 days okay. from, it's 90 and it days may not take us that long to appoint members. So why don't you just appoint two members? It may not take us that long to I think Caroline's got to go. Well, but it's 90 days you have to have a vote. No, 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 Chris, so Chris, Chris Caroline's saying okay. it wouldn't take us this long to appoint two members. Yeah, right, we have that one. And you know, if we appointed members, it wouldn't. Right, wouldn't matter because they weren't ever used. Right. So just do that. Sorry. I took us down a wormhole I shouldn't have. Okay, so. Thank you. Oh, can, you can you forward the, did you get the email? You got the response? I did. I asked Flora to forward it. Floor to floor oh, I just had a she, she, she said she would, so. I okay. Thank you. Okay. Trying to do okay. Um, um, any um, board members um, have a burning, burning issues that we need to address that uh, outside of the ones that Bill raised? I'm what, when's our next meeting? Um, well, we were going to set the one with the staff. But that's so just, that's, I, I, I'm hopeful that that's what so you're going to talk about. So your next meeting. Those issues. Yes. Yeah. But that might be the next one. I don't think it. I think I'm. I actually was hoping that we're going to have a separate one that with community staff members, administration talking about the. I mean, our next scheduled meeting might be after we do oh, that oh, meeting. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So December sixth is. Is the next scheduled. Okay. Is, so no, it wouldn't that, be. Hold on. You're the second Thursday. It's just that today is off. You would be December thirteenth. Right. So if we want to meet with the staff, I would think, yeah, unless we want to do it that. after the holiday break, nope. we would do it like yeah. the first Wednesday. I don't know why I picked Wednesday. That's actually terrible, but <laughs> whatever. You said okay, early we'll, December. We'll pick an earlier day in December, yeah. Um, so two things. The two items that are mine that are on here are the, um, is the increased data collection on Romney School Quality, which is kind of a re-envisioning of the staff board communication piece, much bigger. I, I did send it around to the board members. Next time I'll note it that you're not on that email list. Um, is this something that you... What did you send around? Because I only remember seeing the article that you sent on schools. Did anybody else get it? I you got it. Because you responded to me. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. So I will send it again. 
It is a, um, a proposal, a very specific proposal about using different um, instruments that are out there to, that are other measures of school quality besides um, hmm. uh, test scores, you know. Um, oh, sorry, one-way proposal for data gathering. I don't know how I missed it. It was in between Allison's and Krista's. So yes, I did get it. So, okay. Well, this very, I can see this working actually quite well in a conversation that we would have with the staff because it's really about, you know, how are we getting, you know, what kind of information do we need to be getting? How are we measuring it? And, you know, what are our mechanisms? Um, so I'd be totally happy to move it to that meeting, but I'm, I'm nervous about moving it much beyond. Okay. So let's do that. So, okay. so let me just going to take up Brian's uh, suggestion about housekeeping. So um, let's deal with the uh, approve the minutes from uh, September 26, coming 2018 meeting. Uh, is there a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. Second. Any comments or questions about the September 26, 2018 uh, minutes? Yes. I think that, let's see, on, my, on page three of our packet, I don't know how it comes out for you. It's, um, this teacher feels what's best for kids needs to be looked at. I think, um, just, are, are you in there? Mm -hmm. um, she feels that low inco lower income families would be affected disproportionately by a merger. Um, she understands the concerns with cost and ramifications, but um, feels that joining a lawsuit would be, would be um, our best choice. I'm sure I said a politi political, the word political, but I don't, that, that captures more what I was kind of getting. Okay, uh, any others? Um, the, uh, up above on, uh, on that same page, um, where uh, first paragraph, um, uh, maybe you did this as well, Logan. um, I know that I did, uh, sort of recommended hosting a meeting, um, here to talk about the implications of Act 46. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you didn't say that, just clarifying that that was. I did, but um, but let's put you in there as well. Any other changes? I'm sorry, um, what did you want to add that? <coughs> oh, that is, uh, so sort of in the, uh, towards the bottom of the first paragraph uh, mm -hmm. where uh, to receive a written update and host a meeting in Middlesex of the committee to talk about the draft articles. Oh, and then um, under the, the bullet point under my name in the middle, but regarding the meeting protocol, it's, uh, I believe that would be regarding the merger. Any others? Is there a motion to move to approve? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, second, is there a motion to um, approve the minutes from October 24, 2018? So moved. Second? Second. Any, oh, did you just <laughs> any changes? Then anyone proposes to those minutes? Um, I, I, Amy, let's see, on the bottom of page six, <coughs> this was where we were talking about this, you know, sort of the whole conversation about the schedule. Um, it says, Ms. Toth met with the staff and the group decided to make some small adjustments and have agreed to leave things as is right now. Um, my sense was that, that maybe, um, but my understanding from you was that it was somewhat different and that there had been, um, you know, the group, that there was some concern and that you had gone back with some, you know, some things you absolutely wanted included and the, and there had been, a, um, hadn't quite gotten to a, a place of agreement, but um, it, it was still. Um, That's not what was said at the meeting. Okay, so tell me what was said because. Um, um, so I charged the group of teachers to independently of me try to see if there were 
I, I basically gave them the option to start over. Yep. Or to find small wins and to s sort of navigate that together. Um, the things that we were hoping to hold on to were the amount of um, planning time needed to be equitable between teachers, that um, the core classes needed, you know, the a similar type of uh, timing, and that the the days needed to be somewhat similar for kids. Okay, and those were your those were kind of what we mutually were agreed upon. Everybody agreed upon them, or that those were things that you. I mean, this I is about fixing the minutes. Is I there know, a problem yeah. with the minutes that yeah, you think they're inaccurate? I do because it um it, it sounds like the group decided to make adjustments and agreed th to leave things as is right now. My sense is that that my sense even from that conversation was that it was not perhaps quite that. Um, you know that there was still some tension, and that um, you had um, sort of gone back and forth in kind of a negotiation, and had not yet agreed uh, reached a place where everybody was in agreement. Um, I think we should go back and watch then, and bring okay. these minutes up at the next one because okay. when I watch the video, having not even read the minutes because I wasn't going to vote on them, not being there, I feel like that yeah, statement was okay. almost said explicitly. Let's do that. So okay, okay so then we're going to hold uh, on voting on these until our next meeting. <laughs> Is, are yes. you going to check out the video? Or? Well, Warden's one of concern. Yeah. I you think okay. you should. Great. Okay. Um, do we have board orders? Yes, you do. They're in the red folder right okay, there. Okay, shall we do those so we don't... Uh... Okay, is there a motion? Motion to approve the board orders. The dollar amount is $60,128.25. Moved. Is there a second? Okay. Um, any questions about the board orders? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you want to camera? Yes. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Pass. Um, okay, Bill, a budget presentation? Sorry, Bill. I just need, I need two seconds to email my daughter. Oh, sure. Or Tell her we daughter. say hello. And <laughs> sorry. <laughs> if you'd like and to sorry. run to People's Academy and pick her up right now. <laughs> oh, no. Uh-oh. Is she driving? Uh, we're three months away from that. I'll be glad when that day happens. <laughs> That's what you say till yeah, it happens. Yeah, in the middle of February. Well, you know what? It's actually <laughs> if, uh, liberating. Yeah, just liberating. I can understand that. Like that, and when you last right. that, that a day go mom. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> All right, Thank so you. a couple okay. of things before we get into the budget itself. I want to be clear about the budget as clear as possible. Can I have my red folder? That actually is one of the key things that makes me Thank remember you. them for every board meeting. That is that <coughs> color that's <coughs> in the right place? Um, I wanted to do a little bit about the budget process I wasn't able to do at the last meeting. Um, with Act 46, we're, I've talked about this for the past couple of months um, with most boards. I just, I don't think I've had a chance to talk with the Romney board about this. Um, back in <coughs> August, we had a conversation at the executive committee and they, we advised, we came up with a strategy for if there was a merger happening and if there wasn't a merger happening and how could we make it so we weren't doing multiple budgets because we just don't have the capacity and what's happening inside the amount of workload that's on the central office, especially lowering the fiscal office. That's the place I'm really concerned these days. Um, so um, we're putting together a budget that can go either way. So we're basically doing it by parts right now, that we're doing each school as its own entity, but that we could pull that together into one combined budget for a cross and that we're not looking for anything that emerges <coughs> would do for possible savings this fiscal year that we're budgeting for, which is 2020. So in doing that, um, as if the merger were to be 
approved by the state. They're on the date the merger that the state authorizes it. This board doesn't have authorization over FY20. Okay. And so because of that, and the way the draft articles of agreement run, that all that moves to the transition board and the transition board actually has any authorization. They only have recommendations that they give to a new supervisory union board. One of the things I want to ensure as your superintendent is that the budget process stays even more transparent than it's been in the past. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't stop having input from the community and from the board. I think that's really important to keep going through all this. When there's instability, getting more transparent is better. So. Um, I'd like to still have budget as a part of the December and part of the January. The timetable is much different with a merger. We have to wait for the new board to be seated and they have to recommend a budget to the community. <coughs> so there would be a budget vote somewhere in there in the draft articles they recommend that it's done before May 1st. So in doing that, wait, I'm sorry, who then prepares that the people who would be um, so it's the a transition. It's a transition. But one there are two tasks for the transition board. Chris and yeah. we've been going through the articles committee. There are two tasks for the transition boards to support the election of new members and that petitions are happening to support new members to come to a merged board and to put together a budget that's recommended to the new board. Um, there's a timeline that's really tight. And so that means uh, really the new board gets uh, voted in around on town meeting day, hopefully, and then within 14 days has their first meeting. And probably within that first, that first meeting warrants for a budget vote because you have to warrant 30 to 40 days prior. So you've got to do this by like March 23rd, I believe, is the timeline to get it before to, May 1st. To warn it, right? Yeah, to warn it. So we're on a pretty tight timeline. That's the 40th day. The 30th day is like the somewhere, whatever 10 days forward is of that. Um, and so and to do all that, I would like to keep bringing you budgets for input mm -hmm. and then all that input and with all the boards and all that input would go then on to the transition board. Mm -hmm. If we were not to merge, we would be on the same timeline and the, uh, we would need an injunction to stop that work. Um, that would cause us to then bring that, if there was an injunction that had to stay on that, then we would come back to this. I believe I have not confirmed with the school's attorney on that, but um, from what I'm hearing, that's probably the best, the way we would go. Um, then we would look for an approval, and the question is, would we be ready, and are the town clerks ready to take town reports? Because <laughs> the reason we have, we have to push on you so fast to do um, an adoption of a budget by Martin Luther King Day is we try to get it into the town report. There are some towns in Vermont that don't do that. They get the now you have a warning date that the warning has to be prepared for, but they don't have the budget going to the town report. They have a separate way of getting that out, and they don't have the pressure of all the dates. Just trying to be as transparent as possible. I know I'm giving a lot of information, so. It, it's kind of a little bit of a, uh, just some uncertainty. And so I'm trying to play, and this is the conversation we had with the executive committee back in August of like, how do we make all this work and everything together together? <coughs> Did I miss anything, Chris, that you've been in part for conversations? Did I hit it? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna okay. operate as though we're merging until and unless anything comes saying we're not? Uh, I think the opposite. Yeah. Well, I think for the budget, I'm going to be giving you the budget. If as though I, we're our own board. Right. As we're our own board right now. Yeah. Once we get past, I believe the, I don't think the state board is going to give us anything on the 14th as a final ruling from the work that I've seen that they still have to do. So I believe that their next meeting after that is the 28th. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm, this is Bill mm -hmm. just thinking. I have no information from the background. Just seeing the work they've got to do. Um, and then say, okay, um, once that comes out, you know, where do we go next? Whether there's a merger or not, I still want to have meetings here to talk about budget to be able to get input and say, where would you like to go with it? It really, Chris, you've been concerned about the threshold. And if you merge, Rumney 
we'll be in a much better place against excess spending than where you currently are right now. Because it, the merge district, you will have, um, you won't be close to the excess spending threshold because of where the other budgets are in the other community, in the other schools. So the district as a whole would not be. You're right. Yeah. And well, they, you don't go down to the school level. You just right. stay at the district level. And so right. right now with where last year's, we know we, the expenditures pushed us right up and then we got to re, it's always an estimate. And then we learned that we're about $30,000 away from the threshold for total dollars. So with this budget, how close are we? Um, I can't tell you any more than what I just told you about how we were last year. Okay. Because it has to do with pupils, yeah. and we don't have equalized we pupils, that in December. and we don't get that till December. So I can't really tell you that. Well, let me. Um, the given the stability of our population, is there a sense as to just even a, a Chris? One or two students could change it quite a bit. Yeah. I can't. I can't. It, I, Lori. I used to do this to Lori. What you're doing to me. Yeah. And she finally came in and said, "Asking questions." Well, no, no. If you want me to estimate, I'm not going to do it anymore. Okay. She said it just because I will make errors and then people will make decisions and people like hard and fast money numbers. And I've learned from my mistakes. So we had talked about us as a board talking about where we fell in terms of hitting the, sh the threshold and how much of an impact we wanted that to um, how much we wanted that to affect our budget decisions. Mm -hmm. Do we want to have that discussion now? We should. I, I, um, I'm like having trouble comprehending words to tell you the truth. It's really late. Okay. <laughs> I would um, rather make another meeting where I feel like I can think about this if that would, I know that that's really hard for everybody to make meetings, but mm -hmm. if you guys need to have it, I'll do my best, but. What's the consensus on how people are feeling right now in terms of moving or adjourning? What is the uh, what is the administration waiting on from us? I mean, what what is going to be the <coughs> if we don't give guidance now? Um, that'd be one concern that I'd have. Um, so we're bringing. Maybe I can give you two minutes, and then you can make a decision after sure. that. I'm not going to tell you how I got to the numbers I got to. I'm just going to tell you how, what the bottom number is and how I compare it. Okay. Your increase is 2.67% with a level service budget. That means keeping all the staffing the same and taking into the consideration of changing student needs for that need support. And the scheduled increase in pay, insurance, all that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, that's why I said don't ask me those type of questions. I'm trying to cut to the chase. Got it. The current CPI for September 2018, most boards like to know this, is 3.3%. It's consumer price index increase, or you might think of it as inflation. The cost for, and this is regional, New England regional. New England regional for schools and government is 2.9%. You're below both of those. Um, all the budgets in Washington Central, if you just look at expenditures, are below, th or at 3% or below. Our friends in Doty and Callis are seeing a significant increase because of the loss of small schools and title yeah. funds. So they've got some huge pieces. You haven't had title funds, so it's not hurting you. We're losing federal dollars. So besides that overall, I mean, we're, everyone's hit a 3% or below target that I gave them as the superintendent, which it, it actually didn't, it doesn't mean we had to reduce anything. I said, but I'd like to see us at three. In um, anticipated future negotiations, which number do we use, the 2.9 or the 3.3%? We use the 3.3 according to what we said it before in previous years. Okay. And um, we have a negotiation piece in here for salary estimates, but I do not like to release oh, right. it. It's a negotiation. Negotiation. I forgot it was a negotiation. I will also tell you that um, <coughs> Amy has been working on some changes, but we haven't put any dollars to those, so we would bring those to you next time we met. And on draft two, which is December. <coughs> changes that would increase the budget or decrease it? Uh, if you know, know if we've even costed that some of those things out, so I can't really tell you that much. We talked really quickly in my office the other day with Lori about some changes, but we didn't do any money conversation on them. Yeah. I think Caroline Please. asked <clears throat> at some meeting in the distant past um, how much if we don't, if we get the extra fee, 
that thing. What is it? How much, like, per $100,000? Like, what we need to, is it so five, five dollars? Is it? So for every extra penny you have to raise in taxes that's above the threshold, you have to raise an additional penny to give back to the state ed fund. Okay, and it's $26,000 for every penny, I think? So I, get, I sent you, uh, I also include this packet, the multi-year budget. If you look at page 22, there's some keys to school calculation. And it, one cent on the tax rate, and this is last year's, but it's good enough barometer for you, is $28,000 in expenditure. Okay, it's right on page, so right. If page we 22. Were, okay, no, Allison, that's, that's right fine. here. It's a really good key. That. So if we used that and we just pretended that we were over the threshold by 28000 I have a penny. Then it would be... Another penny you'd have to raise. Another one on the taxes. Right. Per. For, for every... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so what does that work out to, like... Per, so I actually have a really hard time sometimes understanding the tax rate, but I guess we can say this for another time. So that will be December. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain tax rate in December. I can't even okay. do it right now because I don't have enough information to right. give it to you. So, um, what do you know? This what increase? Um, what dollar amount in the budget equates to a penny? That's twenty twenty eight thousand dollars. Twenty eight thousand. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. And that's an estimate from last year. Okay. But it's close. Okay. That's a sh very short budget. <laughs> Thank you. Um, boiler? Boiler. Um, we're and roof. And roof. And roof. We, I did most of the boiler. We're going to go out to bed. Roy's finishing the specs uh, to do what we couldn't do this year because we got bad prices. Uh, the roof, we had a meeting of the warranty company, Wright and Morrissey, um, yeah, it needs Wright and Morrissey. Sorry, too many construction companies. Wright and Morrissey, Black River Design, Bill Ford, myself, and Nate up on the roof. There are things that haven't been done right. They're trying to hire a roofer before snow flies, which is easier said than done. And we gave them what are the A list of roofers um, that do good work and that we all agree do good work. Right now it's just trying to schedule them to get here to do major, major big pieces of patching up there. Um, right away, as soon as this guy came from Mule Hut, he's like, yeah, we need to fix that, we need to fix this, and we need to fix this, and we need to fix that. Was that what happened? We were waiting for the snow to melt off the roof so the guy from Mule Hut could come and tell us what to fix? The first one, yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right, and so this has just been a process of now identifying how to actually fix it? No, what's happened is we've had to go through several leaks to the point where we could say, send us, I think it might have been one, of the, I don't know if he's their top inspector or who it is, okay. but someone different they did and he's like yeah that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong and you shouldn't have all these little patches around here so we're going to take out big chunks and re-bond back in big chunks of the and rubber is that, memory. And how is that being paid for? Is, is they're doing it. They, they are they, That's what it. the warranty is. Okay. I just, if they're not, for a while we'll, that was unclear. If, that wait, was if they're not it's what is I mean I've been talking with your legal counsel who Chris knows quite well so He's, he's involved and he's been our legal counsel for all construction pieces. Okay. And we're working on how do we, you know, and I don't really want to, and he's agreed, Sandy Fee has agreed with me, your legal counsel. Let's not get pay a lot of money to him if we can get movement going. If we can't get movement going. Okay. And and he's been very, he's extremely, he's one of the nicest he's guys. Yeah, he's, 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 he's yeah, sure. great yeah. guy. That's, yeah. that's what so I think. Is that going to yeah, fix it? Are they going to pay for it? I don't have... I don't have confirmation that we can actually get it scheduled with one of these A-list roofing companies before the snow flies. Okay. And, they, and, the, and the warranty companies out in northern Wisconsin, so they get it. Like, guys, I don't want snow on this roof. And they're like, no, we don't either. And, but the problem is construction in Vermont right now, everything's booming. Costs to do things, I won't be surprised if we have higher costs for our boiler than we did last year with a bad bidding timeline because things are escalating construction costs really rapidly right now. Everyone's got, got more work than they know what to do. You know, is it worthwhile waiting for the A yes. people? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's We're not doing that again. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> anything else that we need to address? On the roof and boiler? Oh, or any other aspect of the... Uh, 
agenda. Well, Bill, you and I have had a conversation. Can you just give the board a brief update of the time, the process and the timeline for the principal evaluation? Yep. That's going to be done in January, so it's happening fast. I thought we agreed to move it to December. We agreed to, let's just... Let me ask you, is it some, well, if we're going to uh, be... A principal evaluation is something I would want to have a lot of discussion about. So I would well, like to move it to when we can discuss it and not just hear timelines that I already have memorized. Okay, so and then maybe for the rest of us we'll hear timelines. Um, or but, if we, but if we are... Uh, the process is going to happen in January? It yeah, be it will be done by January. By January what? Probably we may need an extra meeting for the end of January. Okay. Um, so, can we hear the timeline, please? So, right now, we're in the, um, and you set our goals last year. We've had reflection back and forth of that goals. There's a, we have had to change our supervision evaluation pr uh, process for principals because of new state requirements to change to the new professional standards, educational standards for, sorry, professional, I'm losing my words, professional standards for educational leaders. Um, for 2015, we've changed to the Nebraska rubric, which we use for that. And then we're collecting evidence through observations. Uh, my walkthroughs of the building, we'll be doing surveys as we have in the past, and Amy's self-evaluation and her evidence that she's submitting. Very similar to what you've seen for those of you who've taken part in my my system, all that, I compile all that. I'll be asking you for a board. I'll be surveying the board for comments as well as uh, reflection back on those uh, standards. And then I'll be summing all that up with a recommendation at the end of January. Okay, so who will, who's the survey go to? To staff, to the board, and I've done it to parents. And this is the procedure that you're using for all school yep. leaders in yep. the SU? Yep. Including assistant principals? Uh, I don't do the assistant principals. The principals do? The principals do. Thanks. There's only two assistant principals now left in the system. So um, is this the first year that the surveys have been used for So we have to re I have to realign the surveys because there are new standards. That's so I can't okay. use the surveys I've done before, and I will tell you right now, I do not have that work done. I have to go do that work. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be December or early January that those surveys are run just because just because of all the other work. Sure. Um, I, I am literally working in checklist mode right now. If it needs to be done for tomorrow, it gets done today. Okay. Um, and you said the, is the Nebraska standard? So yeah, we, Vermont does not set its own rubrics and standards for, for educators. You think that for leaders, it would be great if they did. They do that for teachers. And so they said to us, go find a rubric that you are in a definition you'd like to use that aligns with the professional standards for educational leaders. Uh, the leadership team and I looked at this this past year. Uh, we actually have made an electronic system to collect all this data, which we didn't have before. And uh, we agreed that the Nebraska rubric, after looking at four or five different rubrics, it cut it down from 10 standards to eight. It combined a couple and that that was, and it, the reason we liked it, it's similar to what you've seen on my rubric, for those of you who've been through that, is it not only had performance levels and descriptors of the performance levels, but it had the uh, nice suggestion of possible evidence to show where the criterion is. So as for most uh, good evaluation systems or student work evaluations, you say, where does the evidence come from? And then a description of what the evidence should look like. And we like Nebraska because they did that. Okay. And they usually get pretty high scores, Nebraska does, on what they set up for a system. Now, remember, most of this nation student performance is part of um, it's part of evaluation. So in Vermont, it's a suggestion. It's not a requirement. And so for that part of the Nebraska, which had a whole metric that formula took from the Nebraska student results and put that forward we're not using that and I'd be glad to give you the rubric I mean it's I will give you the rubric when I give you my report okay thank yeah. you
Mm-hmm. I think, well, just the one thing I want to add is I feel like um, I, mean, I know we've gotten in trouble in the past um, from our principal in terms of not um, perhaps laying out um, areas of improvement and clear steps that that person could take. And I was not on the board, so perhaps this was done, but um, but I, I didn't see evidence of it in, in um, what I've seen. And, and so I would just, you know, in my workplace, um, we get, you know, however many standards and we are either exceeding or meeting or not quite there, you know, and, and I would hope that we, um, for anything where someone, you know, where the principal might be not quite there, that we would have a very clear um, kind of a moving, a, a formative piece in terms of laying out, you know, sort of here's where we see the gaps are and, you know, we want to plan. Um, because I think that we probably could have done much better by our school had we done that in the past. And that's something I plan to do after I finish the evaluation. That's usually the first part of the next goal setting cycle. So I just want to be really and transparent. So did we ever see those? I mean, like this is—it's funny because last year, I mean, I've been on for eighteen months, but it was such a weird year. My first year. We don't usually do that with the board. With the board. We did. I think yeah. I was going to say we uh, have. It to. was one of my first, second meetings. I remember giving you evaluations, it which was I a do. Goal. Anyway, maybe. I know I was pressed my first couple of years, and I was resistance to it. Yeah, but just be um, transparent. Okay, because I think that that I think that the I just I believe that um, you get more authentic and better performance when people feel they can do that in a more quiet realm. Mm-hmm. Um, did the principals have a chance to view the Nebraska rubric? Prior to July first, no. During the, it happened during the summer. Okay. Have they seen it now? I think so. I can hand it, I send it through email. And I know we had a quick conversation about it, and people. I mean, this is how fast it went. They shipped you guys. Do you want? And they're like, it was three of us that chose it, and of the leadership team. So we make subcommittees to do things because we know we can't all be there to do mm-hmm. everything. And they're like, we're fine. Go. I mean, that's. I mean, that's about how long the conversation was. Okay. Is but it's not a drastic change from. I, I mean, I just want to make sure that people so from are the well stand, aware of how they're the, being evaluated. In the ISLIC standards mm-hmm. from 2008 to the professional standards for educational leaders in 2015, the major change is that instructional leadership is now in there. Mm-hmm. It was very minor in educational leaders, and now it's very prominent. And that's why we went from six standards to ten standards. That it's really. It's, and that's something in Vermont that we've been doing pretty well, but without the backing of the standards to tell us to do it and to evaluate on it. And the other components, that was like the observations, walkthroughs, self-assessment, surveys, surveying the board. That was all the same prior? Yeah, same prior methodologies, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks very much. Yep. Anybody opposed to adjourning? Okay, move to adjourn. Thank you all for coming and staying.